Middlemarch by George Eliot Book 2 Old and Young Chapter 13 First Gent How class your man, as better than the most, or, seeming better, worse beneath that cloak? As saint or knave, pilgrim or hypocrite? 2D Gent Nay, tell me how you class your wealth of books the drifted relics of all time. As well sort them at once by size and livery, vellum, tall copies, and the common calf will hardly cover more diversity than all your labels cunningly devised to class your unread authors. In consequence of what he had heard from Fred, Mr. Vincey determined to speak with Mr. Bolstrode in his private room at the bank at half-past one, when he was usually free from other callers. But a visitor had come in at one o'clock, and Mr. Bolstrode had so much to say to him, that there was little chance of the interview being over in half an hour. The banker's speech was fluent, but it was also copious, and he used up an appreciable amount of time in brief meditative pauses. Do not imagine his sickly aspect to have been of the yellow, black-haired sort, he had a pale blonde skin, thin grey besprinkled brown hair, light grey eyes, and a large forehead. Loud men called his subdued tone an undertone, and sometimes implied that it was inconsistent with openness, though there seems to be no reason why a loud man should not be given to concealment of anything except his own voice, unless it can be shown that Holy Writ has placed the seed of candor in the lungs. Mr. Bulstrode had also a deferential bending attitude in listening, and an apparently fixed attentiveness in his eyes which made those persons who thought themselves worth hearing infer that he was seeking the utmost improvement from their discourse. Others, who expected to make no great figure, disliked this kind of moral lantern turned on them. If you are not proud of your cellar, there is no thrill of satisfaction in seeing your guest hold up his wine glass to the light and look judicial. Such joys are reserved for conscious merit. Hence Mr. Bulstrode's close attention was not agreeable to the publicans and sinners in Middlemarch, it was attributed by some to his being a Pharisee, and by others to his being evangelical. Less superficial reasoners among them wished to know who his father and grandfather were, observing that five and twenty years ago nobody had ever heard of a Bulstrode in Middlemarch. To his present visitor, Lydgate, the scrutinizing look was a matter of indifference, he simply formed an unfavorable opinion of the banker's constitution, and concluded that he had an eager inward life with little enjoyment of tangible things. I shall be exceedingly obliged if you will look in on me here occasionally, Mr. Lydgate, the banker observed, after a brief pause. If, as I dare to hope, I have the privilege of finding you a valuable coadjutor in the interesting matter of hospital management, there will be many questions which we shall need to discuss in private. As to the new hospital, which is nearly finished, I shall consider what you have said about the advantages of the special destination for fevers. The decision will rest with me, for though Lord Medlicote has given the land and timber for the building, he is not disposed to give his personal attention to the object. There are few things better worth the pains in a provincial town like this, said Lydgate. A fine fever hospital in addition to the old infirmary might be the nucleus of a medical school here, when once we get our medical reforms, and what would do more for medical education than the spread of such schools over the country? A born provincial man who has a grain of public spirit as well as a few ideas, should do what he can to resist the rush of everything that is a little better than common towards London. Any valid professional aims may often find a freer, if not a richer field, in the provinces. One of Lydgate's gifts was a voice habitually deep and sonorous, yet capable of becoming very low and gentle at the right moment. About his ordinary bearing there was a certain fling, a fearless expectation of success, a confidence in his own powers and integrity much fortified by contempt for petty obstacles or seductions of which he had had no experience. But this proud openness was made lovable by an expression of unaffected goodwill. Mr. Bulstrode perhaps liked him the better for the difference between them in pitch and manners, he certainly liked him the better, as Rosamond did, for being a stranger in Middlemarch. One can begin so many things with a new person, even begin to be a better man. 
I shall rejoice to furnish your zeal with fuller opportunities, Mr. Bolstrode answered, I mean, by confiding to you the superintendence of my new hospital, should a maturer knowledge favor that issue, for I am determined that so great an object shall not be shackled by our two physicians. Indeed, I am encouraged to consider your advent to this town as a gracious indication that a more manifest blessing is now to be awarded to my efforts, which have hitherto been much withstood. With regard to the old infirmary, we have gained the initial point, I mean your election. And now I hope you will not shrink from incurring a certain amount of jealousy and dislike from your professional brethren by presenting yourself as a reformer. I will not profess bravery, said Lydgate, smiling, but I acknowledge a good deal of pleasure in fighting, and I should not care for my profession, if I did not believe that better methods were to be found and enforced there as well as everywhere else. The standard of that profession is low in Middlemarch, my dear sir, said the banker. I mean in knowledge and skill not in social status, for our medical men are most of them connected with respectable townspeople here. My own imperfect health has induced me to give some attention to those palliative resources which the divine mercy has placed within our reach. I have consulted eminent men in the metropolis, and I am painfully aware of the backwardness under which medical treatment labors in our provincial districts. Yes, with our present medical rules and education, one must be satisfied now and then to meet with a fair practitioner. As to all the higher questions which determine the starting point of a diagnosis, as to the philosophy of medical evidence, any glimmering of these can only come from a scientific culture of which country practitioners have usually no more notion than the man in the moon. Mr. Bulstrode, bending and looking intently, found the form which Lydgate had given to his agreement not quite suited to his comprehension. Under such circumstances a judicious man changes the topic and enters on ground where his own gifts may be more useful. I am aware, he said, that the peculiar bias of medical ability is towards material means. Nevertheless, Mr. Lydgate, I hope we shall not vary in sentiment as to a measure in which you are not likely to be actively concerned, but in which your sympathetic concurrence may be an aid to me. You recognize, I hope the existence of spiritual interests in your patients? Certainly I do. But those words are apt to cover different meanings to different minds. Precisely. And on such subjects wrong teaching is as fatal as no teaching. Now a point which I have much at heart to secure is a new regulation as to clerical attendance at the old infirmary. The building stands in Mr. Fairbrother's parish. You know Mr. Fairbrother? I have seen him. He gave me his vote. I must call to thank him. He seems a very bright pleasant little fellow. And I understand he is a naturalist. Mr. Fairbrother, my dear sir, is a man deeply painful to contemplate. I suppose there is not a clergyman in this country who has greater talents. Mr. Bulstrode paused and looked meditative. I have not yet been pained by finding any excessive talent in Middlemarch, said Lydgate, bluntly. What I desire, Mr. Bulstrode continued, looking still more serious, is that Mr. Fairbrother's attendance at the hospital should be superseded by the appointment of a chaplain, of Mr. Tyke, in fact, and that no other spiritual aid should be called in. As a medical man I could have no opinion on such a point unless I knew Mr. Tyke, and even then I should require to know the cases in which he was applied. Lydgate smiled, but he was bent on being circumspect. Of course you cannot enter fully into the merits of this measure at present. But, here Mr. Bolstrode began to speak with a more chiseled emphasis, the subject is likely to be referred to the medical board of the infirmary, and what I trust one may ask of you is, that in virtue of the cooperation between us which I now look forward to, you will not so far as you are concerned, be influenced by my opponents in this matter. I hope I shall have nothing to do with clerical disputes, said Lydgate. The path I have chosen is to work well in my own profession. My responsibility, Mr. Lydgate, is of a broader kind. With me, indeed, this question is one of sacred accountableness, whereas with my opponents, I have good reason to say that it is an occasion for gratifying a spirit of worldly opposition.
but I shall not therefore drop one iota of my convictions, or cease to identify myself with that truth which an evil generation hates. I have devoted myself to this object of hospital improvement, but I will boldly confess to you, Mr. Lydgate, that I should have no interest in hospitals if I believed that nothing more was concerned therein than the cure of mortal diseases. I have another ground of action, and in the face of persecution I will not conceal it. Mr. Bulstrode's voice had become a loud and agitated whisper as he said the last words. There we certainly differ, said Lydgate. But he was not sorry that the door was now opened, and Mr. Vincy was announced. That florid sociable personage was become more interesting to him since he had seen Rosamond. Not that, like her, he had been weaving any future in which their lots were united, but a man naturally remembers a charming girl with pleasure, and is willing to dine where he may see her again. Before he took leave, Mr. Vincy had given that invitation which he had been, in no hurry about, for Rosamond at breakfast had mentioned that she thought her uncle Featherstone had taken the new doctor into great favor. Mr. Bulstrode, alone with his brother-in-law, poured himself out a glass of water, and opened a sandwich box. I cannot persuade you to adopt my regimen, Vincy. No, no, I've no opinion of that system. Life wants padding, said Mr. Vincy, unable to omit his portable theory. However, he went on, accenting the word, as if to dismiss all irrelevance, what I came here to talk about was a little affair of my young scapegrace, Fred's. That is a subject on which you and I are likely to take quite as different views as on diet, Vincy. I hope not this time. Mr. Vincy was resolved to be good-humored. The fact is, it's about a whim of old Featherstone's. Somebody has been cooking up a story out of spite, and telling it to the old man, to try to set him against Fred. He's very fond of Fred, and is likely to do something handsome for him, indeed he has as good as told Fred that he means to leave him his land, and that makes other people jealous. Vincy, I must repeat, that you will not get any concurrence from me as to the course you have pursued with your eldest son. It was entirely from worldly vanity that you destined him for the church, with a family of three sons and four daughters, you were not warranted in devoting money to an expensive education which has succeeded in nothing but in giving him extravagant idle habits. You are now reaping the consequences. To point out other people's errors was a duty that Mr. Bulstrode rarely shrank from, but Mr. Vincy was not equally prepared to be patient. When a man has the immediate prospect of being mayor, and is ready, in the interests of commerce, to take up a firm attitude on politics generally, he has naturally a sense of his importance to the framework of things which seems to throw questions of private conduct into the background. And this particular reproof irritated him more than any other. It was eminently superfluous to him to be told that he was reaping the consequences. But he felt his neck under Bulstrode's yoke, and though he usually enjoyed kicking, he was anxious to refrain from that relief. As to that, Bulstrode, it's no use going back. I'm not one of your pattern men, and I don't pretend to be. I couldn't foresee everything in the trade, there wasn't a finer business in Middlemarch than ours, and the lad was clever. My poor brother was in the church, and would have done well, had got preferment already, but that stomach fever took him off, else he might have been a dean by this time. I think I was justified in what I tried to do for Fred. If you come to religion, it seems to me a man shouldn't want to carve out his meat to an ounce beforehand, one must trust a little to providence and be generous. It's a good British feeling to try and raise your family a little, in my opinion, it's a father's duty to give his sons a fine chance. I don't wish to act otherwise than as your best friend, Vincy, when I say that what you have been uttering just now is one mass of worldliness and inconsistent folly. Very well, said Mr. Vincy, kicking in spite of resolutions, I never profess to be anything but worldly, and, what's more, I don't see anybody else who is not worldly. I suppose you don't conduct business on what you call unworldly principles. The only difference I see is that one worldliness is a little bit honester than another. This kind of discussion is unfruitful, Vincy, said Mr. Bulstrode, 
who, finishing his sandwich, had thrown himself back in his chair, and shaded his eyes as if weary. You had some more particular business. Yes, yes. The long and short of it is, somebody has told old Featherstone, giving you as the authority, that Fred has been borrowing or trying to borrow money on the prospect of his land. Of course you never said any such nonsense. But the old fellow will insist on it that Fred should bring him a denial in your handwriting, that is, just a bit of a note saying you don't believe a word of such stuff, either of his having borrowed or tried to borrow in such a fool's way. I suppose you can have no objection to do that. Pardon me. I have an objection. I am by no means sure that your son, in his recklessness and ignorance, I will use no severer word, has not tried to raise money by holding out his future prospects, or even that someone may not have been foolish enough to supply him on so vague a presumption, there is plenty of such lax money lending as of other folly in the world. But Fred gives me his honor that he has never borrowed money on the pretense of any understanding about his uncle's land. He is not a liar. I don't want to make him better than he is. I have blown him up well, nobody can say I wink at what he does. But he is not a liar. And I should have thought, but I may be wrong, that there was no religion to hinder a man from believing the best of a young fellow, when you don't know worse. It seems to me it would be a poor sort of religion to put a spoke in his will by refusing to say you don't believe such harm of him as you've got no good reason to believe. I am not at all sure that I should be befriending your son by smoothing his way to the future possession of Featherstone's property. I cannot regard wealth as a blessing to those who use it simply as a harvest for this world. You do not like to hear these things, Vincy, but on this occasion I feel called upon to tell you that I have no motive for furthering such a disposition of property as that which you refer to. I do not shrink from saying that it will not tend to your son's eternal welfare or to the glory of God. Why then should you expect me to pen this kind of affidavit, which has no object but to keep up a foolish partiality and secure a foolish bequest? If you mean to hinder everybody from having money but saints and evangelists, you must give up some profitable partnerships, that's all I can say, Mr. Vincy burst out very bluntly. It may be for the glory of God but it is not for the glory of the Middlemarch trade, that Plymdale's house uses those blue and green dyes it gets from the brassing manufactory, they rot the silk, that's all I know about it. Perhaps if other people knew so much of the profit went to the glory of God, they might like it better. But I don't mind so much about that, I could get up a pretty row, if I chose. Mr. Bulstrode paused a little before he answered. You pain me very much by speaking in this way, Vincy. I do not expect you to understand my grounds of action, it is not an easy thing even to thread a path for principles in the intricacies of the world, still less to make the thread clear for the careless and the scoffing. You must remember, if you please, that I stretch my tolerance towards you as my wife's brother, and that it little becomes you to complain of me as withholding material help towards the worldly position of your family. I must remind you that it is not your own prudence or judgment that has enabled you to keep your place in the trade. Very likely not, but you have been no loser by my trade yet, said Mr. Vincy, thoroughly nettled, a result which was seldom much retarded by previous resolutions. And when you married Harriet, I don't see how you could expect that our family should not hang by the same nail. If you've changed your mind, and want my family to come down in the world, you'd better say so. I've never changed, I'm a plain churchman now, just as I used to be before doctrines came up. I take the world as I find it, in trade and everything else. I'm contented to be no worse than my neighbors. But if you want us to come down in the world, say so. I shall know better what to do then. You talk unreasonably. Shall you come down in the world for want of this letter about your son? Well, whether or not, I consider it very unhandsome of you to refuse it. Such doings may be lined with religion, but outside they have a nasty, dog-in-the-manger look. You might as well slander Fred, it comes pretty near to it when you refuse to say you didn't set a slander going. It's this sort of thing, this tyrannical spirit, wanting to play bishop and banker everywhere, 
it's this sort of thing makes a man's name stink. Vinci, if you insist on quarreling with me, it will be exceedingly painful to Harriet as well as myself, said Mr. Bulstrode, with a trifle more eagerness and paleness than usual. I don't want to quarrel. It's for my interest, and perhaps for yours too, that we should be friends. I bear you no grudge, I think no worse of you than I do of other people. A man who half starves himself, and goes the length in family prayers, and so on, that you do, believes in his religion whatever it may be, you could turn over your capital just as fast with cursing and swearing, plenty of fellows do. You like to be master, there's no denying that, you must be first chop in heaven, else you won't like it much. But you're my sister's husband, and we ought to stick together, and if I know Harriet, she'll consider it your fault if we quarrel because you strain at a gnat in this way, and refuse to do Fred a good turn. And I don't mean to say I shall bear it well. I consider it unhandsome. Mr. Vincey rose, began to button his greatcoat, and looked steadily at his brother-in-law, meaning to imply a demand for a decisive answer. This was not the first time that Mr. Bulstrode had begun by admonishing Mr. Vincey, and had ended by seeing a very unsatisfactory reflection of himself in the coarse unflattering mirror which that manufacturer's mind presented to the subtler lights and shadows of his fellow men, and perhaps his experience ought to have warned him how the scene would end. But a full-fed fountain will be generous with its waters even in the rain, when they are worse than useless, and a fine fount of admonition is apt to be equally irrepressible. It was not in Mr. Bulstrode's nature to comply directly in consequence of uncomfortable suggestions. Before changing his course, he always needed to shape his motives and bring them into accordance with his habitual standard. He said, at last, I will reflect a little, Vincy. I will mention the subject to Harriet. I shall probably send you a letter. Very well. As soon as you can, please. I hope it will all be settled before I see you tomorrow. Chapter 14 Follows here the strict receipt for that sauce to dainty meat, named idleness, which many eat by preference, and call it sweet, first watch for morsels, like a hound mix well with buffets, stir them round with good thick oil of flatteries, and froth with mean self-lauding lies. Serve warm, the vessels you must choose to keep it in are dead men's shoes. Mr. Bulstrode's consultation of Harriet seemed to have had the effect desired by Mr. Vincey, for early the next morning a letter came which Fred could carry to Mr. Featherstone as the required testimony. The old gentleman was staying in bed on account of the cold weather, and as Mary Garth was not to be seen in the sitting room, Fred went upstairs immediately and presented the letter to his uncle, who, propped up comfortably on a bed rest, was not less able than usual to enjoy his consciousness of wisdom in distrusting and frustrating mankind. He put on his spectacles to read the letter, pursing up his lips and drawing down their corners. Under the circumstances I will not decline to state my conviction, cha. What fine words the fellow puts. He's as fine as an auctioneer, that your son Frederick has not obtained any advance of money on bequests promised by Mr. Featherstone promised? Who said I had ever promised? I promise nothing, I shall make codicils as long as I like, and that considering the nature of such a proceeding, it is unreasonable to presume that a young man of sense and character would attempt it, but the gentleman doesn't say you are a young man of sense and character, mark you that, sir, as to my own concern with any report of such a nature. I distinctly affirm that I never made any statement to the effect that your son had borrowed money on any property that might accrue to him on Mr. Featherstone's demise, bless my heart. Property, accrue, demise. Lawyer Standish is nothing to him. He couldn't speak finer if he wanted to borrow. Well, Mr. Featherstone here looked over his spectacles at Fred, while he handed back the letter to him with a contemptuous gesture. You don't suppose I believe a thing because Bulstrode writes it out fine, eh? Fred colored. You wish to have the letter, sir. I should think it very likely that Mr. Bulstrode's denial is as good as the authority which told you what he denies. Every bit. I never said I believed either one or the other. 
And now what do you expect? said Mr. Featherstone, curtly, keeping on his spectacles, but withdrawing his hands under his wraps. I expect nothing, sir. Fred with difficulty restrained himself from venting his irritation. I came to bring you the letter. If you like I will bid you good morning. Not yet, not yet. Ring the bell, I want Missy to come. It was a servant who came in answer to the bell. Tell Missy to come, said Mr. Featherstone, impatiently. What business had she to go away? He spoke in the same tone when Mary came. Why couldn't you sit still here till I told you to go? I want my waistcoat now. I told you always to put it on the bed. Mary's eyes looked rather red, as if she had been crying. It was clear that Mr. Featherstone was in one of his most snappish humors this morning, and though Fred had now the prospect of receiving the much-needed present of money, he would have preferred being free to turn round on the old tyrant and tell him that Mary Garth was too good to be at his beck. Though Fred had risen as she entered the room, she had barely noticed him, and looked as if her nerves were quivering with the expectation that something would be thrown at her. But she never had anything worse than words to dread. When she went to reach the waistcoat from a peg, Fred went up to her and said, Allow me. Let it alone. You bring it, Missy, and lay it down here, said Mr. Featherstone. Now you go away again till I call you, he added, when the waistcoat was laid down by him. It was usual with him to season his pleasure in showing favor to one person by being especially disagreeable to another, and Mary was always at hand to furnish the condiment. When his own relatives came she was treated better. Slowly he took out a bunch of keys from the waistcoat pocket, and slowly he drew forth a tin box which was under the bedclothes. You expect I am going to give you a little fortune, eh, he said, looking above his spectacles and pausing in the act of opening the lid. Not at all, sir. You were good enough to speak of making me a present the other day, else, of course, I should not have thought of the matter. But Fred was of a hopeful disposition, and a vision had presented itself of a sum just large enough to deliver him from a certain anxiety. When Fred got into debt, it always seemed to him highly probable that something or other, he did not necessarily conceive what, would come to pass enabling him to pay in due time. And now that the providential occurrence was apparently close at hand, it would have been sheer absurdity to think that the supply would be short of the need, as absurd as a faith that believed in half a miracle for want of strength to believe in a whole one. The deep-veined hands fingered many banknotes one after the other, laying them down flat again, while Fred leaned back in his chair, scorning to look eager. He held himself to be a gentleman at heart, and did not like courting an old fellow for his money. At last, Mr. Featherstone eyed him again over his spectacles and presented him with a little sheaf of notes, Fred could see distinctly that there were but five, as the less significant edges gaped towards him. But then, each might mean fifty pounds. He took them, saying, I am very much obliged to you, sir, and was going to roll them up without seeming to think of their value. But this did not suit Mr. Featherstone, who was eyeing him intently. Come, don't you think it worth your while to count em? You take money like a lord. I suppose you lose it like one. I thought I was not to look a gift horse in the mouth, sir. But I shall be very happy to count them. Fred was not so happy, however, after he had counted them. For they actually presented the absurdity of being less than his hopefulness had decided that they must be. What can the fitness of things mean, if not their fitness to a man's expectations? Failing this, absurdity and atheism gaped behind him. The collapse for Fred was severe when he found that he held no more than five twenties, and his share in the higher education of this country did not seem to help him. Nevertheless he said, with rapid changes in his fair complexion, it is very handsome of you, sir. I should think it is, said Mr. Featherstone, locking his box and replacing it, then taking off his spectacles deliberately, and at length, as if his inward meditation had more deeply convinced him, repeating, I should think it handsome. I assure you, sir, I am very grateful, said Fred, who
who had had time to recover his cheerful air. So you ought to be. You want to cut a figure in the world, and I reckon Peter Featherstone is the only one you've got to trust to. Here the old man's eyes gleamed with a curiously mingled satisfaction in the consciousness that this smart young fellow relied upon him, and that the smart young fellow was rather a fool for doing so. Yes, indeed, I was not born to very splendid chances. Few men have been more cramped than I have been, said Fred, with some sense of surprise at his own virtue, considering how hardly he was dealt with. It really seems a little too bad to have to ride a broken-winded hunter, and see men, who, are not half such good judges as yourself, able to throw away any amount of money on buying bad bargains. Well, you can buy yourself a fine hunter now. Eighty pound is enough for that, I reckon, and you'll have twenty pound over to get yourself out of any little scrape, said Mr. Featherstone, chuckling slightly. You are very good, sir, said Fred, with a fine sense of contrast between the words and his feeling. I, rather a better uncle than your fine uncle Bolstrode. You won't get much out of his speculations, I think. He's got a pretty strong string round your father's leg, by what I hear, eh? My father never tells me anything about his affairs, sir. Well, he shows some sense there. But other people find them out without his telling. He'll never have much to leave you, he'll most like die without a will, he's the sort of man to do it, let M make him mayor of Middlemarch as much as they like. But you won't get much by his dying without a will, though you are the eldest son. Fred thought that Mr. Featherstone had never been so disagreeable before. True, he had never before given him quite so much money at once. Shall I destroy this letter of Mr. Bulstrode's, sir, said Fred, rising with the letter as if he would put it in the fire. I, I, I don't want it. It's worth no money to me. Fred carried the letter to the fire, and thrust the poker through it with much zest. He longed to get out of the room, but he was a little ashamed before his inner self, as well as before his uncle, to run away immediately after pocketing the money. Presently, the farm bailiff came up to give his master a report, and Fred, to his unspeakable relief, was dismissed with the injunction to come again soon. He had longed not only to be set free from his uncle, but also to find Mary Garth. She was now in her usual place by the fire, with sewing in her hands and a book open on the little table by her side. Her eyelids had lost some of their redness now, and she had her usual air of self-command. Am I wanted upstairs, she said, half rising as Fred entered. No, I am only dismissed, because Simmons is gone up. Mary sat down again, and resumed her work. She was certainly treating him with more indifference than usual, she did not know how affectionately indignant he had felt on her behalf upstairs. May I stay here a little, Mary, or shall I bore you? Pray sit down, said Mary you will not be so heavy a bore as Mr. John Wall, who was here yesterday, and he sat down without asking my leave. Poor fellow. I think he is in love with you. I am not aware of it. And to me it is one of the most odious things in a girl's life, that there must always be some supposition of falling in love coming between her and any man who is kind to her, and to whom she is grateful. I should have thought that I, at least, might have been safe from all that. I have no ground for the nonsensical vanity of fancying everybody who comes near me is in love with me. Mary did not mean to betray any feeling, but in spite of herself she ended in a tremulous tone of vexation. Confound John Wall. I did not mean to make you angry. I didn't know you had any reason for being grateful to me. I forgot what a great service you think it if any one snuffs a candle for you. Fred also had his pride, and was not going to show that he knew what had called forth this outburst of Mary's. Oh, I am not angry, except with the ways of the world. I do like to be spoken to as if I had common sense. I really often feel as if I could understand a little more than I ever hear even from young gentlemen who have been to college. Mary had recovered, and she spoke with a suppressed rippling undercurrent of laughter pleasant to hear. I don't care how merry you are at my expense this morning, said Fred, 
I thought you looked so sad when you came upstairs. It is a shame you should stay here to be bullied in that way. Oh, I have an easy life, by comparison. I have tried being a teacher, and I am not fit for that, my mind is too fond of wandering on its own way. I think any hardship is better than pretending to do what one is paid for, and never really doing it. Everything here I can do as well as anyone else could, perhaps better than some, Rosie, for example. Though she is just the sort of beautiful creature that is imprisoned with ogres in fairy tales. Rosie, cried Fred, in a tone of profound brotherly skepticism. Come, Fred, said Mary, emphatically, you have no right to be so critical. Do you mean anything particular, just now? No, I mean something general, always. Oh, that I am idle and extravagant. Well, I am not fit to be a poor man. I should not have made a bad fellow if I had been rich. You would have done your duty in that state of life to which it has not pleased God to call you, said Mary, laughing. Well, I couldn't do my duty as a clergyman, any more than you could do yours as a governess. You ought to have a little fellow feeling there, Mary. I never said you ought to be a clergyman. There are other sorts of work. It seems to me very miserable not to resolve on some course and act accordingly. So I could, if, Fred broke off, and stood up, leaning against the mantelpiece. If you were sure you should not have a fortune? I did not say that. You want to quarrel with me. It is too bad of you to be guided by what other people say about me. How can I want to quarrel with you? I should be quarreling with all my new books, said Mary, lifting the volume on the table. However naughty you may be to other people, you are good to me. Because I like you better than anyone else. But I know you despise me. Yes, I do, a little, said Mary, nodding, with a smile. You would admire a stupendous fellow, who would have wise opinions about everything. Yes, I should. Mary was sewing swiftly, and seemed provokingly mistress of the situation. When a conversation has taken a wrong turn for us, we only get farther and farther into the swamp of awkwardness. This was what Fred Vincy felt. I suppose a woman is never in love with anyone she has always known, ever since she can remember, as a man often is. It is always some new fellow who strikes a girl. Let me see, said Mary, the corners of her mouth curling archly, I must go back on my experience. There is Juliet, she seems an example of what you say. But then Ophelia had probably known Hamlet a long while, and Brenda Troil, she had known Mordaunt Merton ever since they were children, but then he seems to have been an estimable young man, and Minna was still more deeply in love with Cleveland, who was a stranger. Waverley was new to Flora McIvor, but then she did not fall in love with him. And there are Olivia and Sophia Primrose, and Corinne, they may be said to have fallen in love with new men. Altogether, my experience is rather mixed. Mary looked up with some roguishness at Fred, and that look of hers was very dear to him, though the eyes were nothing more than clear windows where observation sat laughingly. He was certainly an affectionate fellow, and as he had grown from boy to man, he had grown in love with his old playmate, notwithstanding that share in the higher education of the country which had exalted his views of rank and income. When a man is not loved, it is no use for him to say that he could be a better fellow, could do anything, I mean, if he were sure of being loved in return. Not of the least use in the world for him to say he could be better. Might, could, would, they are contemptible auxiliaries. I don't see how a man is to be good for much unless he has some one woman to love him dearly. I think the goodness should come before he expects that. You know better, Mary. Women don't love men for their goodness. Perhaps not. But if they love them, they never think them bad. It is hardly fair to say I am bad. I said nothing at all about you. I never shall be good for anything, Mary if you will not say that you love me, if you will not promise to marry me, I mean, when I am able to marry. If I did love you, I would not marry you, 
I would certainly not promise ever to marry you. I think that is quite wicked, Mary. If you love me, you ought to promise to marry me. On the contrary, I think it would be wicked in me to marry you even if I did love you. You mean, just as I am, without any means of maintaining a wife. Of course, I am but three and twenty. In that last point you will alter. But I am not so sure of any other alteration. My father says an idle man ought not to exist, much less, be married. Then I am to blow my brains out? No, on the whole I should think you would do better to pass your examination. I have heard Mr. Fairbrother say it is disgracefully easy. That is all very fine. Anything is easy to him. Not that cleverness has anything to do with it. I am ten times cleverer than many men who pass. Dear me, said Mary, unable to repress her sarcasm, that accounts for the curates like Mr. Krause. Divide your cleverness by ten, and the quotient, dear me, is able to take a degree. But that only shows you are ten times more idle than the others. Well, if I did pass, you would not want me to go into the church? That is not the question, what I want you to do. You have a conscience of your own, I suppose. There. There is Mr. Lydgate. I must go and tell my uncle. Mary, said Fred, seizing her hand as she rose, if you will not give me some encouragement, I shall get worse instead of better. I will not give you any encouragement, said Mary, reddening. Your friends would dislike it, and so would mine. My father would think it a disgrace to me if I accepted a man who got into debt, and would not work. Fred was stung, and released her hand. She walked to the door, but there she turned and said, Fred, you have always been so good, so generous to me. I am not ungrateful. But never speak to me in that way again. Very well, said Fred, sulkily, taking up his hat and whip. His complexion showed patches of pale pink and dead white. Like many a plucked idle young gentleman, he was thoroughly in love, and with a plain girl, who had no money. But having Mr. Featherstone's land in the background, and a persuasion that, let Mary say what she would, she really did care for him, Fred was not utterly in despair. When he got home, he gave four of the twenties to his mother, asking her to keep them for him. I don't want to spend that money, mother. I want it to pay a debt with. So keep it safe away from my fingers. Bless you, my dear, said Mrs. Vincy. She doted on her eldest son and her youngest girl, a child of six, whom others thought her two naughtiest children. The mother's eyes are not always deceived in their partiality, she at least can best judge who is the tender, filial-hearted child. And Fred was certainly very fond of his mother. Perhaps it was his fondness for another person also that made him particularly anxious to take some security against his own liability to spend the hundred pounds. For the creditor to whom he owed a hundred and sixty held a firmer security in the shape of a bill signed by Mary's father. Chapter 15 Black eyes you have left, you say, blue eyes fail to draw you, yet you seem more rapt today, than of old we saw you. Oh! I track the fairest fair through new haunts of pleasure, footprints here and echoes there guide me to my treasure, lo! She turns, immortal youth wrought to mortal stature, fresh as starlight's aged truth, many named nature. A great historian, as he insisted on calling himself, who had the happiness to be dead a hundred and twenty years ago, and so to take his place among the colossi whose huge legs our living pettiness is observed to walk under, glories in his copious remarks and digressions as the least imitable part of his work, and especially in those initial chapters to the successive books of his history, where he seems to bring his armchair to the proscenium and chat with us in all the lusty ease of his fine English. But Fielding lived when the days were longer, for time, like money, is measured by our needs, when summer afternoons were spacious, and the clock ticked slowly in the winter evenings. We belated historians must not linger after his example, and if we did so, it is probable that our chat would be thin and eager, as if delivered from a campstool in a parrot house. 
I at least have so much to do in unraveling certain human lots, and seeing how they were woven and interwoven, that all the light I can command must be concentrated on this particular web, and not dispersed over that tempting range of relevancies called the universe. At present I have to make the new settler Lydgate better known to anyone interested in him than he could possibly be even to those who had seen the most of him since his arrival in Middlemarch. For surely all must admit that a man may be puffed and belauded, envied, ridiculed, counted upon as a tool and fallen in love with, or at least selected as a future husband, and yet remain virtually unknown, known merely as a cluster of signs for his neighbor's false suppositions. There was a general impression, however, that Lydgate was not altogether a common country doctor, and in Middlemarch at that time such an impression was significant of great things being expected from him. For everybody's family doctor was remarkably clever, and was understood to have immeasurable skill in the management and training of the most skittish or vicious diseases. The evidence of his cleverness was of the higher intuitive order, lying in his lady patient's immovable conviction, and was unassailable by any objection except that their intuitions were opposed by others equally strong, each lady who saw medical truth in wrench and the strengthening treatment regarding toller and the lowering system as medical perdition. For the heroic times of copious bleeding and blistering had not yet departed, still less the times of thoroughgoing theory, when disease in general was called by some bad name, and treated accordingly without shilly shilly, as if, for example, it were to be called insurrection, which must not be fired on with blank cartridge, but have its blood drawn at once. The strengtheners and the lowerers were all clever men in somebody's opinion, which is really as much as can be said for any living talents. Nobody's imagination had gone so far as to conjecture that Mr. Lydgate could know as much as Dr. Sprague and Dr. Minchin, the two physicians, who alone could offer any hope when danger was extreme, and when the smallest hope was worth a guinea. Still, I repeat, there was a general impression that Lydgate was something rather more uncommon than any general practitioner in Middlemarch. And this was true. He was but seven and twenty, an age at which many men are not quite common, at which they are hopeful of achievement, resolute in avoidance, thinking that mammon shall never put a bit in their mouths and get astride their backs, but rather that mammon, if they have anything to do with him, shall draw their chariot. He had been left an orphan when he was fresh from a public school. His father, a military man, had made but little provision for three children, and when the boy Tertius asked to have a medical education, it seemed easier to his guardians to grant his request by apprenticing him to a country practitioner than to make any objections on the score of family dignity. He was one of the rarer lads who early get a decided bent and make up their minds that there is something particular in life which they would like to do for its own sake, and not because their fathers did it. Most of us who turn to any subject with love remember some morning or evening hour when we got on a high stool to reach down an untried volume, or sat with parted lips listening to a new talker, or for very lack of books began to listen to the voices within, as the first traceable beginning of our love. Something of that sort happened to Lydgate. He was a quick fellow, and when hot from play, would toss himself in a corner, and in five minutes be deep in any sort of book that he could lay his hands on, if it were Rasselas or Gulliver, so much the better, but Bailey's Dictionary would do, or the Bible with the Apocrypha in it. Something he must read, when he was not riding the pony, or running and hunting, or listening to the talk of men. All this was true of him at ten years of age, he had then read through, Chrysal, or The Adventures of a Guinea, which was neither milk for babes, nor any chalky mixture meant to pass for milk, and it had already occurred to him that books were stuff, and that life was stupid. His school studies had not much modified that opinion, for though he did his classics and mathematics, he was not preeminent in them. It was said of him, that Lydgate could do anything he liked, but he had certainly not yet liked to do anything remarkable. He was a vigorous animal with a ready understanding, but no spark had yet kindled in him an intellectual passion, Knowledge seemed to him a very superficial affair, easily mastered, judging from the conversation of his elders, he had apparently got already more than was necessary for mature life. 
Probably this was not an exceptional result of expensive teaching at that period of short-waisted coats and other fashions which have not yet recurred. But, one vacation, a wet day sent him to the small home library to hunt once more for a book which might have some freshness for him, in vain. Unless, indeed, he took down a dusty row of volumes with grey paper backs and dingy labels, the volumes of an old cyclopedia which he had never disturbed. It would at least be a novelty to disturb them. They were on the highest shelf, and he stood on a chair to get them down. But he opened the volume which he first took from the shelf, somehow, one is apt to read in a makeshift attitude, just where it might seem inconvenient to do so. The page he opened on was under the head of anatomy, and the first passage that drew his eyes was on the valves of the heart. He was not much acquainted with valves of any sort, but he knew that valvi were folding doors, and through this crevice came a sudden light startling him with his first vivid notion of finely adjusted mechanism in the human frame. A liberal education had of course left him free to read the indecent passages in the school classics, but beyond a general sense of secrecy and obscenity in connection with his internal structure, had left his imagination quite unbiased, so that for anything he knew his brains lay in small bags at his temples, and he had no more thought of representing to himself how his blood circulated than how paper served instead of gold. But the moment of vocation had come, and before he got down from his chair, the world was made new to him by a presentiment of endless processes filling the vast spaces planked out of his sight by that wordy ignorance which he had supposed to be knowledge. From that hour Lydgate felt the growth of an intellectual passion. We are not afraid of telling over and over again how a man comes to fall in love with a woman and be wedded to her, or else be fatally parted from her. Is it due to excess of poetry or of stupidity that we are never weary of describing what King James called a woman's macdom and her fairness, never weary of listening to the twanging of the old troubadour strings, and are comparatively uninterested in that other kind of macdom and fairness, which must be wooed with industrious thought and patient renunciation of small desires? In the story of this passion, too, the development varies, sometimes it is the glorious marriage, sometimes frustration and final parting. And not seldom the catastrophe is bound up with the other passion, sung by the troubadours. For in the multitude of middle-aged men who go about their vocations in a daily course determined for them much in the same way as the tie of their cravats, there is always a good number who once meant to shape their own deeds and alter the world a little. The story of their coming to be Chopin after the average and fit to be packed by the gross, is hardly ever told even in their consciousness, for perhaps their ardor in generous unpaid toil cooled as imperceptibly as the ardor of other youthful loves, till one day their earlier self walked like a ghost in its old home and made the new furniture ghastly. Nothing in the world more subtle than the process of their gradual change. In the beginning they inhaled it unknowingly, you and I may have sent some of our breath towards infecting them, when we uttered our conforming falsities or drew our silly conclusions, or perhaps it came with the vibrations from a woman's glance. Lydgate did not mean to be one of those failures, and there was the better hope of him because his scientific interest soon took the form of a professional enthusiasm, he had a youthful belief in his breadwinning work, not to be stifled by that initiation in makeshift called his prentice days and he carried to his studies in London, Edinburgh, and Paris, the conviction that the medical profession as it might be was the finest in the world, presenting the most perfect interchange between science and art, offering the most direct alliance between intellectual conquest and the social good. Lydgate's nature demanded this combination, he was an emotional creature, with a flesh-and-blood sense of fellowship which withstood all the abstractions of special study. He cared not only for cases, but for John and Elizabeth, especially Elizabeth. There was another attraction in his profession, it wanted reform, and gave a man an opportunity for some indignant resolve to reject its venal decorations and other humbug, and to be the possessor of genuine though undemanded qualifications. He went to study in Paris with the determination that when he came home again he would settle in some provincial town as a general practitioner, 
and resist the irrational severance between medical and surgical knowledge in the interest of his own scientific pursuits, as well as of the general advance, he would keep away from the range of London intrigues, jealousies, and social truckling, and win celebrity, however slowly, as Jenner had done, by the independent value of his work. For it must be remembered that this was a dark period, and in spite of venerable colleges which used great efforts to secure purity of knowledge by making it scarce, and to exclude error by a rigid exclusiveness in relation to fees and appointments, it happened that very ignorant young gentlemen were promoted in town, and many more got a legal right to practice over large areas in the country. Also, the high standard held up to the public mind by the College of Physicians, which gave its peculiar sanction to the expensive and highly rarefied medical instruction obtained by graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, did not hinder quackery from having an excellent time of it, for since professional practice chiefly consisted in giving a great many drugs, the public inferred that it might be better off with more drugs still, if they could only be got cheaply, and hence swallowed large cubic. Measures of physic prescribed by unscrupulous ignorance which had taken no degrees. Considering that statistics had not yet embraced a calculation as to the number of ignorant or canting doctors which absolutely must exist in the teeth of all changes, it seemed to Lydgate that a change in the units was the most direct mode of changing the numbers. He meant to be a unit who would make a certain amount of difference towards that spreading change which would one day tell appreciably upon the averages, and in the meantime have the pleasure of making an advantageous difference to the viscera of his own patients. But he did not simply aim at a more genuine kind of practice than was common. He was ambitious of a wider effect, he was fired with the possibility that he might work out the proof of an anatomical conception and make a link in the chain of discovery. Does it seem incongruous to you that a Middlemarch surgeon should dream of himself as a discoverer? Most of us, indeed, know little of the great originators until they have been lifted up among the constellations and already rule our fates. But that Herschel, for example, who broke the barriers of the heavens, did he not once play a provincial church organ and give music lessons to stumbling pianists? Each of those shining ones had to walk on the earth among neighbors who perhaps thought much more of his gait and his garments than of anything which was to give him a title to everlasting fame, each of them had his little local personal history sprinkled with small temptations and sordid cares, which made the retarding friction of his course towards final companionship with the immortals. Lydgate was not blind to the dangers of such friction, but he had plenty of confidence in his resolution to avoid it as far as possible being seven and twenty, he felt himself experienced. And he was not going to have his vanities provoked by contact with the showy worldly successes of the capital, but to live among people who could hold no rivalry with that pursuit of a great idea which was to be a twin object with the assiduous practice of his profession. There was fascination in the hope that the two purposes would illuminate each other, the careful observation and inference which was his daily work, the use of the lens to further his judgment in special cases, would further his thought as an instrument of larger inquiry. Was not this the typical preeminence of his profession? He would be a good Middlemarch doctor, and by that very means keep himself in the track of far-reaching investigation. On one point he may fairly claim approval at this particular stage of his career, he did not mean to imitate those philanthropic models who make a profit out of poisonous pickles to support themselves while they are exposing adulteration, or hold shares in a gambling hell that they may have leisure to represent the cause of public morality. He intended to begin in his own case some particular reforms which were quite certainly within his reach, and much less of a problem than the demonstrating of an anatomical conception. One of these reforms was to act stoutly on the strength of a recent legal decision, and simply prescribe, without dispensing drugs or taking percentage from druggists. This was an innovation for one who had chosen to adopt the style of general practitioner in a country town, and would be felt as offensive criticism by his professional brethren. But Lydgate meant to innovate in his treatment also, and he was wise enough to see that the best security for his practicing honestly according to his belief was to get rid of systematic temptations to the contrary. Perhaps that was a more cheerful time for observers and theorizers than the present, 
we are apt to think it the finest era of the world when America was beginning to be discovered, when a bold sailor, even if he were wrecked, might alight on a new kingdom, and about 1829 the dark territories of pathology were a fine America for a spirited young adventurer. Lydgate was ambitious above all to contribute towards enlarging the scientific, rational basis of his profession. The more he became interested in special questions of disease, such as the nature of fever or fevers, the more keenly he felt the need for that fundamental knowledge of structure which just at the beginning of the century had been illuminated by the brief and glorious career of Bichat, who died when he was only one and thirty, but, like another Alexander, left a realm large enough for many heirs. That great Frenchman first carried out the conception that living bodies, fundamentally considered, are not associations of organs which can be understood by studying them first apart, and then, as it were federally, but must be regarded as consisting of certain primary webs or tissues, out of which the various organs, brain, heart, lungs, and so on, are compacted, as the various accommodations of a house are built up in various proportions of wood, iron, stone, brick, zinc, and the rest, each material having its peculiar composition and proportions. No man, one sees, can understand and estimate the entire structure or its parts, what are its frailties and what its repairs, without knowing the nature of the materials. And the conception wrought out by Bichat, with his detailed study of the different tissues, acted necessarily on medical questions as the turning of gaslight would act on a dim, oil-lit street, showing new connections and hitherto hidden facts of structure which must be taken into account in considering the symptoms of maladies and the action of medicaments. But results which depend on human conscience and intelligence work slowly, and now at the end of 1829, most medical practice was still strutting or shambling along the old paths, and there was still scientific work to be done which might have seemed to be a direct sequence of Bichas. This great seer did not go beyond the consideration of the tissues as ultimate facts in the living organism, marking the limit of anatomical analysis, but it was open to another mind to say, have not these structures some common basis from which they have all started, as your SARS net, gauze, net, satin, and velvet from the raw cocoon? Here would be another light, as of oxyhydrogen, showing the very grain of things, and revising all former explanations. Of this sequence to Bichat's work, already vibrating along many currents of the European mind, Lydgate was enamored, he longed to demonstrate the more intimate relations of living structure, and helped to define men's thought more accurately after the true order. The work had not yet been done, but only prepared for those who knew how to use the preparation. What was the primitive tissue? In that way Lydgate put the question, not quite in the way required by the awaiting answer, but such missing of the right word befalls many seekers. And he counted on quiet intervals to be watchfully seized, for taking up the threads of investigation, on many hints to be won from diligent application, not only of the scalpel, but of the microscope, which research had begun to use again with new enthusiasm of reliance. Such was Lydgate's plan of his future, to do good small work for Middlemarch, and great work for the world. He was certainly a happy fellow at this time, to be seven and twenty, without any fixed vices, with a generous resolution that his action should be beneficent, and with ideas in his brain that made life interesting quite apart from the cultus of horseflesh and other mystic rites of costly observance, which the eight hundred pounds left him after buying his practice would certainly not have gone far in paying for. He was at a starting point which makes many a man's career a fine subject for betting, if there were any gentleman given to that amusement who could appreciate the complicated probabilities of an arduous purpose, with all the possible thwartings and furtherings of circumstance, all the niceties of inward balance, by which a man swims and makes his point or else is carried headlong. The risk would remain even with close knowledge of Lydgate's character, for character too is a process and an unfolding. The man was still in the making, as much as the Middlemarch doctor and immortal discoverer, and there were both virtues and faults capable of shrinking or expanding. The faults will not, I hope, be a reason for the withdrawal of your interest in him. 
Among our valued friends is there not some one or other who is a little too self-confident and disdainful, whose distinguished mind is a little spotted with commonness, who is a little pinched here and protuberant there with native prejudices, or whose better energies are liable to lapse down the wrong channel under the influence of transient solicitations. All these things might be alleged against Lydgate, but then, they are the periphrases of a polite preacher, who talks of Adam, and would not like to mention anything painful to the purenters. The particular faults from which these delicate generalities are distilled have distinguishable physiognomies, diction, accent, and grimaces, filling up parts in very various dramas. Our vanities differ as our noses do, all conceit is not the same conceit, but varies in correspondence with the minutiae of mental make in which one of us differs from another. Lydgate's conceit was of the arrogant sort, never simpering, never impertinent, but massive in its claims and benevolently contemptuous. He would do a great deal for noodles, being sorry for them, and feeling quite sure that they could have no power over him, he had thought of joining the St. Simonians when he was in Paris, in order to turn them against some of their own doctrines. All his faults were marked by kindred traits, and were those of a man who had a fine baritone, whose clothes hung well upon him, and who even in his ordinary gestures had an air of inbred distinction. Where then lay the spots of commonness? Says a young lady enamored of that careless grace. How could there be any commonness in a man so well-bred, so ambitious of social distinction, so generous and unusual in his views of social duty? As easily as there may be stupidity in a man of genius if you take him unawares on the wrong subject, or as many a man who has the best will to advance the social millennium might be ill-inspired in imagining its lighter pleasures, unable to go beyond Offenbach's music, or the brilliant punning in the last burlesque. Lydgate spots of commonness lay in the complexion of his prejudices, which, in spite of noble intention and sympathy, were half of them such as are found in ordinary men of the world, that distinction of mind which belonged to his intellectual ardor, did not penetrate his feeling and judgment about furniture, or women, or the desirability of its being known, without his telling, that he was better born than other country surgeons. He did not mean to think of furniture at present, but whenever he did so it was to be feared that neither biology nor schemes of reform would lift him above the vulgarity of feeling that there would be an incompatibility in his furniture not being of the best. As to women, he had once already been drawn headlong by impetuous folly, which he meant to be final, since marriage at some distant period would of course not be impetuous. For those who want to be acquainted with Lydgate it will be good to know what was that case of impetuous folly, for it may stand as an example of the fitful swerving of passion to which he was prone, together with the chivalrous kindness which helped to make him morally lovable. The story can be told without many words. It happened when he was studying in Paris, and just at the time when, over and above his other work, he was occupied with some galvanic experiments. One evening, tired with his experimenting, and not being able to elicit the facts he needed, he left his frogs and rabbits to some repose under their trying mysterious dispensation of unexplained shocks, and went to finish his evening at the theatre of the Port St. Martin, where there was a melodrama which he had already seen several times, attracted, not by the ingenious work of the collaborating authors, but by an actress whose part it was to stab her lover, mistaking him for the evil. Designing Duke of the Peace Lydgate was in love with this actress, as a man is in love with a woman whom he never expects to speak to. She was a Provençal, with dark eyes, a Greek profile, and rounded majestic form, having that sort of beauty which carries a sweet matronliness even in youth, and her voice was a soft cooing. She had but lately come to Paris, and bore a virtuous reputation, her husband acting with her as the unfortunate lover. It was her acting which was, no better than it should be, but the public was satisfied. Lydgate's only relaxation now was to go and look at this woman, just as he might have thrown himself under the breath of the sweet south on a bank of violets for a while, without prejudice to his galvanism, to which he would presently return. But this evening the old drama had a new catastrophe. At the moment when the heroine was to act the stabbing of her lover, and he was to fall gracefully, 
the wife veritably stabbed her husband, who fell as death willed. A wild shriek pierced the house, and the Provencal fell swooning, a shriek and a swoon were demanded by the play, but the swooning too was real this time. Lydgate leaped and climbed, he hardly knew how, onto the stage, and was active in help, making the acquaintance of his heroine by finding a contusion on her head and lifting her gently in his arms. Paris rang with the story of this death, was it a murder? Some of the actress's warmest admirers were inclined to believe in her guilt, and liked her the better for it, such was the taste of those times, but Lydgate was not one of these. He vehemently contended for her innocence, and the remote impersonal passion for her beauty which he had felt before, had passed now into personal devotion and tender thought of her lot. The notion of murder was absurd, no motive was discoverable, the young couple being understood to dote on each other, and it was not unprecedented that an accidental slip of the foot should have brought these grave consequences. The legal investigation ended in Madame Lore's release. Lydgate by this time had had many interviews with her, and found her more and more adorable. She talked little, but that was an additional charm. She was melancholy, and seemed grateful, her presence was enough, like that of the evening light. Lydgate was madly anxious about her affection, and jealous lest any other man than himself should win it and ask her to marry him. But instead of reopening her engagement at the Port St. Martin, where she would have been all the more popular for the fatal episode, she left Paris without warning, forsaking her little court of admirers. Perhaps no one carried inquiry far except Lydgate, who felt that all science had come to a standstill while he imagined the unhappy lore, stricken by ever-wandering sorrow, herself wandering, and finding no faithful comforter. Hidden actresses, however, are not so difficult to find as some other hidden facts, and it was not long before Lydgate gathered indications that Lore had taken the route to Lyons. He found her at last acting with great success at Avignon under the same name, looking more majestic than ever as a forsaken wife carrying her child in her arms. He spoke to her after the play, was received with the usual quietude which seemed to him beautiful as clear depths of water, and obtained leave to visit her the next day, when he was bent on telling her that he adored her, and on asking her to marry him. He knew that this was like the sudden impulse of a madman, incongruous even with his habitual foibles. No matter. It was the one thing which he was resolved to do. He had two selves within him apparently, and they must learn to accommodate each other and bear reciprocal impediments. Strange, that some of us, with quick alternate vision, see beyond our infatuations, and even while we rave on the heights, behold the wide plain where our persistent self pauses and awaits us. To have approached Lore with any suit that was not reverentially tender would have been simply a contradiction of his whole feeling towards her. You have come all the way from Paris to find me, she said to him the next day, sitting before him with folded arms, and looking at him with eyes that seemed to wonder as an untamed ruminating animal wonders. Are all Englishmen like that? I came because I could not live without trying to see you. You are lonely, I love you, I want you to consent to be my wife, I will wait, but I want you to promise that you will marry me, no one else." Lore looked at him in silence with a melancholy radiance from under her grand eyelids, until he was full of rapturous certainty, and knelt close to her knees. I will tell you something, she said, in her cooing way, keeping her arms folded. My foot really slipped. I know, I know, said Lydgate, deprecatingly. It was a fatal accident, a dreadful stroke of calamity that bound me to you the more. Again Lore paused a little and then said, slowly, I meant to do it. Lydgate, strong man as he was, turned pale and trembled, moments seemed to pass before he rose and stood at a distance from her. There was a secret, then, he said at last, even vehemently. He was brutal to you, you hated him. No. He wearied me, he was too fond, he would live in Paris, and not in my country, that was not agreeable to me. Great God, said Lydgate, in a groan of horror. And you planned to murder him? I did not plan, it came to me in the play, I meant to do it. Lydgate stood mute, 
and unconsciously pressed his hat on while he looked at her. He saw this woman, the first to whom he had given his young adoration, amid the throng of stupid criminals. You are a good young man, she said. But I do not like husbands. I will never have another. Three days afterwards Lydgate was at his galvanism again in his Paris chambers, believing that illusions were at an end for him. He was saved from hardening effects by the abundant kindness of his heart and his belief that human life might be made better. But he had more reason than ever for trusting his judgment, now that it was so experienced, and henceforth he would take a strictly scientific view of woman, entertaining no expectations but such as were justified beforehand. No one in Middlemarch was likely to have such a notion of Lydgate's past as has here been faintly shadowed, and indeed the respectable townsfolk there were not more given than mortals generally to any eager attempt at exactness in the representation to themselves of what did not come under their own senses. Not only young virgins of that town, but grey-bearded men also, were often in haste to conjecture how a new acquaintance might be wrought into their purposes, contented with very vague knowledge as to the way in which life had been shaping him for that instrumentality. Middlemarch, in fact, counted on swallowing Lydgate and assimilating him very comfortably. Chapter 16 All that in woman is adored in thy fair self I find, for the whole sex can but afford the handsome and the kind. Sir Charles Sedley The question whether Mr. Tyke should be appointed as salaried chaplain to the hospital was an exciting topic to the Middlemarchers, and Lydgate heard it discussed in a way that threw much light on the power exercised in the town by Mr. Bulstrode. The banker was evidently a ruler, but there was an opposition party, and even among his supporters there were some who allowed it to be seen that their support was a compromise, and who frankly stated their impression that the general scheme of things, and especially the casualties of trade, required you to hold a candle to the devil. Mr. Bulstrode's power was not due simply to his being a country banker, who knew the financial secrets of most traders in the town and could touch the springs of their credit, it was fortified by a beneficence that was at once ready and severe, ready to confer obligations, and severe in watching the result. He had gathered, as an industrious man always at his post, a chief share in administering the town charities, and his private charities were both minute and abundant. He would take a great deal of pains about apprenticing Teg the shoemaker's son, and he would watch over Teg's church going, he would defend Mrs. Stripe the washerwoman against Stubbs's unjust exaction on the score of her drying ground, and he would himself scrutinize a calumny against Mrs. Stripe. His private minor loans were numerous, but he would inquire strictly into the circumstances both before and after. In this way a man gathers a domain in his neighbor's hope and fear as well as gratitude, and power, when once it has got into that subtle region, propagates itself, spreading out of all proportion to its external means. It was a principle with Mr. Bulstrode to gain as much power as possible, that he might use it for the glory of God. He went through a great deal of spiritual conflict and inward argument in order to adjust his motives, and make clear to himself what God's glory required. But, as we have seen, his motives were not always rightly appreciated. There were many crass minds in Middlemarch whose reflective scales could only weigh things in the lump, and they had a strong suspicion that since Mr. Bulstrode could not enjoy life in their fashion, eating and drinking so little as he did, and worrying himself about everything, he must have a sort of vampire's feast in the sense of mastery. The subject of the chaplaincy came up at Mr. Vincy's table when Lydgate was dining there, and the family connection with Mr. Bulstrode did not, he observed, prevent some freedom of remark even on the part of the host himself, though his reasons against the proposed arrangement turned entirely on his objection to Mr. Tyke's sermons, which were all doctrine, and his preference for Mr. Fairbrother, whose sermons were free from that taint. Mr. Vincy liked well enough the notion of the chaplain's having a salary, supposing it were given to Fairbrother, who was as good a little fellow as ever breathed, and the best preacher anywhere, and companionable too. What line shall you take, then, said Mr. Chichley, the coroner, a great coursing comrade of Mr. Vincey's. Oh, I'm precious glad I'm not one of the directors now. 
I shall vote for referring the matter to the directors and the medical board together. I shall roll some of my responsibility on your shoulders, doctor, said Mr. Vinci, glancing first at Dr. Sprague, the senior physician of the town, and then at Lydgate who sat opposite. You medical gentlemen must consult which sort of black draft you will prescribe, eh, Mr. Lydgate? I know little of either, said Lydgate, but in general, appointments are apt to be made too much a question of personal liking. The fittest man for a particular post is not always the best fellow or the most agreeable. Sometimes, if you wanted to get a reform, your only way would be to pension off the good fellows whom everybody is fond of, and put them out of the question. Dr. Sprague, who was considered the physician of most, weight, though Dr. Minchin was usually said to have more, penetration, divested his large heavy face of all expression, and looked at his wine glass while Lydgate was speaking. Whatever was not problematical and suspected about this young man, for example, a certain showiness as to foreign ideas, and a disposition to unsettle what had been settled and forgotten by his elders, was positively unwelcome to a physician whose standing had been fixed thirty years before by a treatise on meningitis, of which at least one copy marked own was bound in calf. For my part one have some fellow feeling with Dr. Sprague, one self-satisfaction is an untaxed kind of property which it is very unpleasant to find deprecated. Lydgate's remark, however, did not meet the sense of the company. Mr. Vincey said, that if he could have his way, he would not put disagreeable fellows anywhere. Hang your reforms, said Mr. Chichley. There's no greater humbug in the world. You never hear of a reform, but it means some trick to put in new men. I hope you are not one of the Lancet's a men, Mr. Lydgate, wanting to take the coronership out of the hands of the legal profession, your words appear to point that way. I disapprove of Wackley, interposed Dr. Sprague, no man more, he is an ill-intentioned fellow, who would sacrifice the respectability of the profession, which everybody knows depends on the London colleges, for the sake of getting some notoriety for himself. There are men who don't mind about being kicked blue if they can only get talked about. But Wackley is right sometimes, the doctor added, judicially. I could mention one or two points in which Wackley is in the right. Oh, well, said Mr. Chichley, I blame no man for standing up in favor of his own cloth, but, coming to argument, I should like to know how a coroner is to judge of evidence if he has not had a legal training? In my opinion, said Lydgate, Legal training only makes a man more incompetent in questions that require knowledge of another kind. People talk about evidence as if it could really be weighed in scales by a blind justice. No man can judge what is good evidence on any particular subject, unless he knows that subject well. A lawyer is no better than an old woman at a post-mortem examination. How is he to know the action of a poison? You might as well say that scanning verse will teach you to scan the potato crops. You are aware, I suppose, that it is not the coroner's business to conduct the post-mortem, but only to take the evidence of the medical witness, said Mr. Chichley, with some scorn. Who is often almost as ignorant as the coroner himself, said Lydgate. Questions of medical jurisprudence ought not to be left to the chance of decent knowledge in a medical witness, and the coroner ought not to be a man who will believe that strychnine will destroy the coats of the stomach if an ignorant practitioner happens to tell him so. Lydgate had really lost sight of the fact that Mr. Chichley was His Majesty's coroner, and ended innocently with the question, Don't you agree with me, Dr. Sprague? To a certain extent, with regard to populous districts, and in the metropolis, said the doctor. But I hope it will be long before this part of the country loses the services of my friend Chichley, even though it might get the best man in our profession to succeed him. I am sure Vinci will agree with me. Yes, yes, give me a coroner who is a good coursing man, said Mr. Vinci, jovially. And in my opinion, you're safest with a lawyer. Nobody can know everything. Most things are a visitation of God. And as to poisoning, why, what you want to know is the law. Come, shall we join the ladies? Lydgate's private opinion was that Mr. Chichley might be the very coroner without bias as to the coats of the stomach, 
but he had not meant to be personal. This was one of the difficulties of moving in good Middlemarch society, it was dangerous to insist on knowledge as a qualification for any salaried office. Fred Vinci had called Lydgate a prig, and now Mr. Chichley was inclined to call him prick-eared, especially when, in the drawing room, he seemed to be making himself eminently agreeable to Rosamond, whom he had easily monopolized in a tete-a-tete, -tete, since Mrs. Vincey herself sat at the tea table. She resigned no domestic function to her daughter, and the matron's blooming good-natured face, with the two volatile pink strings floating from her fine throat and her cheery manners to husband and children, was certainly among the great attractions of the Vincey house, attractions which made it all the easier to fall in love with the daughter. The tinge of unpretentious, inoffensive vulgarity in Mrs. Vincey gave more effect to Rosamond's refinement, which was beyond what Lydgate had expected. Certainly, small feet and perfectly turned shoulders aid the impression of refined manners, and the right thing said seems quite astonishingly right when it is accompanied with exquisite curves of lip and eyelid. And Rosamond could say the right thing, for she was clever with that sort of cleverness which catches every tone except the humorous. Happily she never attempted to joke, and this perhaps was the most decisive mark of her cleverness. She and Lydgate readily got into conversation. He regretted that he had not heard her sing the other day at Stone Court. The only pleasure he allowed himself during the latter part of his stay in Paris was to go and hear music. You have studied music, probably, said Rosamond. No, I know the notes of many birds, and I know many melodies by ear but the music that I don't know at all, and have no notion about, delights me, affects me. How stupid the world is that it does not make more use of such a pleasure within its reach. Yes, and you will find Middlemarch very tuneless. There are hardly any good musicians. I only know two gentlemen who sing at all well. I suppose it is the fashion to sing comic songs in a rhythmic way, leaving you to fancy the tune, very much as if it were tapped on a drum? Ah, you have heard Mr. Bowyer, said Rosamond, with one of her rare smiles. But we are speaking very ill of our neighbors. Lydgate was almost forgetting that he must carry on the conversation, in thinking how lovely this creature was, her garment seeming to be made out of the faintest blue sky, herself so immaculately blonde, as if the petals of some gigantic flower had just opened and disclosed her and yet with this infantine blondness showing so much ready, self-possessed grace. Since he had had the memory of lore, Lydgate had lost all taste for large-eyed silence, the divine cow no longer attracted him, and Rosamond was her very opposite. But he recalled himself. You will let me hear some music tonight, I hope. I will let you hear my attempts, if you like, said Rosamond. Papa is sure to insist on my singing but I shall tremble before you, who have heard the best singers in Paris. I have heard very little, I have only once been to London. But our organist at St. Peter's is a good musician, and I go on studying with him. Tell me what you saw in London. Very little. A more naive girl would have said, oh, everything. But Rosamond knew better. A few of the ordinary sights, such as raw country girls are always taken to. Do you call yourself a raw country girl, said Lydgate, looking at her with an involuntary emphasis of admiration, which made Rosamond blush with pleasure. But she remained simply serious, turned her long neck a little, and put up her hand to touch her wondrous hair plates, an habitual gesture with her as pretty as any movements of a kitten's paw. Not that Rosamond was in the least like a kitten, she was a sylph caught young and educated at Mrs. Lemons. I assure you my mind is raw, she said immediately, I pass at Middlemarch. I am not afraid of talking to our old neighbors. But I am really afraid of you. An accomplished woman almost always knows more than we men, though her knowledge is of a different sort. I am sure you could teach me a thousand things, as an exquisite bird could teach a bear if there were any common language between them. Happily, there is a common language between women and men, and so the bears can get taught. Ah, there is Fred beginning to strum. 
I must go and hinder him from jarring all your nerves, said Rosamond, moving to the other side of the room, where Fred having opened the piano, at his father's desire, that Rosamond might give them some music, was parenthetically performing, cherry ripe, with one hand. Able men who have passed their examinations will do these things sometimes, not less than the plucked Fred. Fred, pray defer your practicing till tomorrow, you will make Mr. Lydgate ill, said Rosamond. He has an ear. Fred laughed, and went on with his tune to the end. Rosamond turned to Lydgate, smiling gently, and said, You perceive, the bears will not always be taught. Now then, Rosie, said Fred, springing from the stool and twisting it upward for her, with a hearty expectation of enjoyment. Some good rousing tunes first. Rosamond played admirably. Her master at Mrs. Lemon's school, close to a county town with a memorable history that had its relics in church and castle, was one of those excellent musicians here and there to be found in our provinces, worthy to compare with many a noted Kapellmeister in a country which offers more plentiful conditions of musical celebrity. Rosamond, with the executant's instinct, had seized his manner of playing, and gave forth his large rendering of noble music with the precision of an echo. It was almost startling, heard for the first time. A hidden soul seemed to be flowing forth from Rosamond's fingers, and so indeed it was, since souls live on in perpetual echoes, and to all fine expression there goes somewhere an originating activity, if it be only that of an interpreter. Lydgate was taken possession of, and began to believe in her as something exceptional. After all, he thought, one need not be surprised to find the rare conjunctions of nature under circumstances apparently unfavorable, come where they may, they always depend on conditions that are not obvious. He sat looking at her, and did not rise to pay her any compliments, leaving that to others, now that his admiration was deepened. Her singing was less remarkable, but also well trained, and sweet to hear as a chime perfectly in tune. It is true she sang, Meet Me by Moonlight, and I've been roaming, for mortals must share the fashions of their time, and none but the ancients can be always classical. But Rosamond could also sing, Black Eyed Susan, with effect, or Haydn's Canzonets, or Voy, Che Sapit, or Batty, Batty, she only wanted to know what her audience liked. Her father looked round at the company, delighting in their admiration. Her mother sat, like a Niobe before her troubles, with her youngest little girl on her lap, softly beating the child's hand up and down in time to the music. And Fred, notwithstanding his general skepticism about Rosie, listened to her music with perfect allegiance, wishing he could do the same thing on his flute. It was the pleasantest family party that Lydgate had seen since he came to Middlemarch. The Vincys had the readiness to enjoy, the rejection of all anxiety, and the belief in life as a merry lot, which made a house exceptional in most county towns at that time, when evangelicalism had cast a certain suspicion as of plague infection over the few amusements which survived in the provinces. At the Vincys there was always whist, and the card tables stood ready now, making some of the company secretly impatient of the music. Before it ceased Mr. Fairbrother came in, a handsome, broad-chested but otherwise small man, about forty, whose black was very threadbare, the brilliancy was all in his quick grey eyes. He came like a pleasant change in the light, arresting little Louisa with fatherly nonsense as she was being led out of the room by Miss Morgan, greeting everybody with some special word, and seeming to condense more talk into ten minutes than had been held all through the evening. He claimed from Lydgate the fulfillment of a promise to come and see him. I can't let you off, you know, because I have some beetles to show you. We collectors feel an interest in every new man till he has seen all we have to show him. But soon he swerved to the whist table, rubbing his hands and saying, Come now, let us be serious. Mr. Lydgate? Not play? Ah! You are too young and light for this kind of thing. Lydgate said to himself that the clergyman whose abilities were so painful to Mr. Bolstrode, appeared to have found an agreeable resort in this certainly not erudite household. He could half understand it, the good humor, the good looks of elder and younger, 
and the provision for passing the time without any labor of intelligence, might make the house beguiling to people who had no particular use for their odd hours. Everything looked blooming and joyous except Miss Morgan, who was brown, dull, and resigned, and altogether, as Mrs. Vincy often said, just the sort of person for a governess. Lydgate did not mean to pay many such visits himself. They were a wretched waste of the evenings, and now, when he had talked a little more to Rosamond, he meant to excuse himself and go. You will not like us at Middlemarch, I feel sure, she said, when the whist players were settled. We are very stupid, and you have been used to something quite different. I suppose all country towns are pretty much alike, said Lydgate. But I have noticed that one always believes one's own town to be more stupid than any other. I have made up my mind to take Middlemarch as it comes, and shall be much obliged if the town will take me in the same way. I have certainly found some charms in it which are much greater than I had expected. You mean the rides towards Tipton and Lowick, every one is pleased with those, said Rosamond, with simplicity. No, I mean something much nearer to me. Rosamond rose and reached her netting, and then said, Do you care about dancing at all? I am not quite sure whether clever men ever dance. I would dance with you if you would allow me. Oh, said Rosamond, with a slight deprecatory laugh. I was only going to say that we sometimes have dancing, and I wanted to know whether you would feel insulted if you were asked to come. Not on the condition I mentioned. After this chat Lydgate thought that he was going, but on moving towards the whist tables, he got interested in watching Mr. Fairbrother's play, which was masterly, and also his face, which was a striking mixture of the shrewd and the mild. At ten o'clock supper was brought in, such were the customs of Middlemarch, and there was punch drinking, but Mr. Fairbrother had only a glass of water. He was winning, but there seemed to be no reason why the renewal of rubbers should end, and Lydgate at last took his leave. But as it was not eleven o'clock, he chose to walk in the brisk air towards the tower of St. Botolph's, Mr. Fairbrother's church, which stood out dark, square, and massive against the starlight. It was the oldest church in Middlemarch, the living, however, was but a vicarage worth barely four hundred a year. Lydgate had heard that, and he wondered now whether Mr. Fairbrother cared about the money he won at cards, thinking, he seems a very pleasant fellow, but Bulstrode may have his good reasons. Many things would be easier to Lydgate if it should turn out that Mr. Bulstrode was generally justifiable. What is his religious doctrine to me, if he carries some good notions along with it? One must use such brains as are to be found. These were actually Lydgate's first meditations as he walked away from Mr. Vincey's, and on this ground I fear that many ladies will consider him hardly worthy of their attention. He thought of Rosamond and her music only in the second place, and though, when her turn came, he dwelt on the image of her for the rest of his walk, he felt no agitation, and had no sense that any new current had set into his life. He could not marry yet, he wished not to marry for several years, and therefore he was not ready to entertain the notion of being in love with a girl whom he happened to admire. He did admire Rosamond exceedingly, but that madness which had once beset him about Lore was not, he thought, likely to recur in relation to any other woman. Certainly, if falling in love had been at all in question, it would have been quite safe with a creature like this Miss Vincy, who had just the kind of intelligence one would desire in a woman, polished, refined, docile, lending itself to finish in all the delicacies of life, and enshrined in a body which expressed this with a force of demonstration that excluded the need for other evidence. Lydgate felt sure that if ever he married, his wife would have that feminine radiance, that distinctive womanhood which must be classed with flowers and music, that sort of beauty which by its very nature was virtuous, being molded only for pure and delicate joys. But since he did not mean to marry for the next five years, his more pressing business was to look into Lewis's new book on fever, which he was specially interested in, because he had known Lewis in Paris, and had followed many anatomical demonstrations in order to ascertain the specific differences of typhus and typhoid. He went home and read far into the smallest hour, 
bringing a much more testing vision of details and relations into this pathological study than he had ever thought it necessary to apply to the complexities of love and marriage, these being subjects on which he felt himself amply informed by literature, and that traditional wisdom which is handed down in the genial conversation of men. Whereas fever had obscure conditions, and gave him that delightful labor of the imagination which is not mere arbitrariness, but the exercise of disciplined power, combining and constructing with the clearest eye for probabilities and the fullest obedience to knowledge, and then, in yet more energetic alliance with impartial nature, standing aloof to invent tests by which to try its own work. Many men have been praised as vividly imaginative on the strength of their profuseness in indifferent drawing or cheap narration, reports of very poor talk going on in distant orbs, or portraits of Lucifer coming down on his bad errands as a large ugly man with bat's wings and spurts of phosphorescence, or exaggerations of wantonness that seem to reflect life in a diseased dream. But these kinds of inspiration Lydgate regarded as rather vulgar and vinous compared with the imagination that reveals subtle actions inaccessible by any sort of lens, but tracked in that outer darkness through long pathways of necessary sequence by the inward light which is the last refinement of energy, capable of bathing even the ethereal atoms in its ideally illuminated space. He for his part had tossed away all cheap inventions where ignorance finds itself able and at ease, he was enamored of that arduous invention which is the very eye of research, provisionally framing its object and correcting it to more and more exactness of relation, he wanted to pierce the obscurity of those minute processes which prepare human misery and joy, those invisible thoroughfares which are the first lurking places of anguish, mania, and crime, that delicate poise and transition, which determine the growth of happy or unhappy consciousness. As he threw down his book, stretched his legs towards the embers in the grate, and clasped his hands at the back of his head, in that agreeable afterglow of excitement when thought lapses from examination of a specific object into a suffusive sense of its connections with all the rest of our existence, seems, as it were, to throw itself on its back after vigorous swimming and float with the repose of unexhausted strength. Lydgate felt a triumphant delight in his studies, and something like pity for those less lucky men who were not of his profession. If I had not taken that turn when I was a lad, he thought, I might have got into some stupid draft horse work or other, and lived always in blinkers. I should never have been happy in any profession that did not call forth the highest intellectual strain, and yet keep me in good warm contact with my neighbors. There is nothing like the medical profession for that, one can have the exclusive scientific life that touches the distance and befriend the old fogies in the parish too. It is rather harder for a clergyman, fair brother seems to be an anomaly. This last thought brought back the Vinci's and all the pictures of the evening. They floated in his mind agreeably enough, and as he took up his bed candle his lips were curled with that incipient smile which is apt to accompany agreeable recollections. He was an ardent fellow, but at present his ardor was absorbed in love of his work and in the ambition of making his life recognized as a factor in the better life of mankind, like other heroes of science who had nothing but an obscure country practice to begin with. Poor Lydgate. Or shall I say, poor Rosamond. Each lived in a world of which the other knew nothing. It had not occurred to Lydgate that he had been a subject of eager meditation to Rosamond, who had neither any reason for throwing her marriage into distant perspective, nor any pathological studies to divert her mind from that ruminating habit, that inward repetition of looks, words, and phrases, which makes a large part in the lives of most girls. He had not meant to look at her or speak to her with more than the inevitable amount of admiration and compliment which a man must give to a beautiful girl, indeed, it seemed to him that his enjoyment of her music had remained almost silent, for he feared falling into the rudeness of telling her his great surprise at her possession of such accomplishment. But Rosamond had registered every look and word, and estimated them as the opening incidents of a preconceived romance, incidents which gather value from the foreseen development and climax. In Rosamond's romance it was not necessary to imagine much about the inward life of the hero, or of his serious business in the world, of course, he had a profession and was clever, 
as well as sufficiently handsome, but the piquant fact about Lydgate was his good birth, which distinguished him from all Middlemarch admirers, and presented marriage as a prospect of rising in rank and getting a little nearer to that celestial condition on earth in which she would have nothing to do with vulgar people, and perhaps at last associate with relatives quite equal to the county people who looked down on the Middlemarchers. It was part of Rosamond's cleverness to discern very subtly the faintest aroma of rank, and once when she had seen the Miss Brooks accompanying their uncle at the county assizes, and seated among the aristocracy, she had envied them, notwithstanding their plain dress. If you think it incredible that to imagine Lydgate as a man of family could cause thrills of satisfaction which had anything to do with the sense that she was in love with him, I will ask you to use your power of comparison a little more effectively, and consider whether red cloth and epaulets have never had an influence of that sort. Our passions do not live apart in locked chambers, but, dressed in their small wardrobe of notions, bring their provisions to a common table and mess together, feeding out of the common store according to their appetite. Rosamond, in fact, was entirely occupied not exactly with Tertius Lydgate as he was in himself, but with his relation to her, and it was excusable in a girl who was accustomed to hear that all young men might, could, would be, or actually were in love with her, to believe at once that Lydgate could be no exception. His looks and words meant more to her than other men's, because she cared more for them, she thought of them diligently, and diligently attended to that perfection of appearance, behavior, sentiments, and all other elegancies, which would find in Lydgate a more adequate admirer than she had yet been conscious of. For Rosamond, though she would never do anything that was disagreeable to her, was industrious, and now more than ever she was active in sketching her landscapes and market carts and portraits of friends, in practicing her music and in being from morning till night her own standard of a perfect lady, having always an audience in her own consciousness, with sometimes the not unwelcome addition of a more variable external audience in the numerous visitors of the house. She found time also to read the best novels, and even the second best, and she knew much poetry by heart. Her favorite poem was, Lala Rook. The best girl in the world. He will be a happy fellow who gets her, was the sentiment of the elderly gentleman who visited the Vincys, and the rejected young men thought of trying again, as is the fashion in country towns where the horizon is not thick with coming rivals. But Mrs. Plymdale thought that Rosamond had been educated to a ridiculous pitch, for what was the use of accomplishments which would be all laid aside as soon as she was married? While her aunt Bulstrode, who had a sisterly faithfulness towards her brother's family, had two sincere wishes for Rosamond, that she might show a more serious turn of mind, and that she might meet with a husband whose wealth corresponded to her habits. Chapter 17 The clerkly person smiled and said Promise was a pretty maid, but being poor she died unwed. The Reverend Camden Fairbrother, whom Lydgate went to see the next evening, lived in an old parsonage, built of stone, venerable enough to match the church which it looked out upon. All the furniture too in the house was old, but with another grade of age, that of Mr. Fairbrother's father and grandfather. There were painted white chairs, with gilding and wreaths on them, and some lingering red silk damask with slits in it. There were engraved portraits of Lord Chancellors and other celebrated lawyers of the last century, and there were old pier glasses to reflect them, as well as the little satinwood tables and the sofas resembling a prolongation of uneasy chairs, all standing in relief against the dark wainscot. This was the physiognomy of the drawing room into which Lydgate was shown, and there were three ladies to receive him, who were also old fashioned, and of a faded but genuine respectability, Mrs. Fair brother, the vicar's white haired mother, befrilled and kerchiefed with dainty cleanliness, upright, quick eyed, and still under seventy, Miss Noble, her sister, a tiny old lady of meeker aspect, with frills and kerchief decidedly more worn and mended, and Miss Winifred Fairbrother, the vicar's elder sister, well-looking like himself, but nipped and subdued as single women are apt to be who spend their lives in uninterrupted subjection to their elders. Lydgate had not expected to see so quaint a group, knowing simply that Mr. Fairbrother was a bachelor, 
he had thought of being ushered into a snuggery where the chief furniture would probably be books and collections of natural objects. The vicar himself seemed to wear rather a changed aspect, as most men do when acquaintances made elsewhere see them for the first time in their own homes, some indeed showing like an actor of genial parts disadvantageously cast for the curmudgeon in a new piece. This was not the case with Mr. Fairbrother, he seemed a trifle milder and more silent, the chief talker being his mother, while he only put in a good-humored moderating remark here and there. The old lady was evidently accustomed to tell her company what they ought to think, and to regard no subject as quite safe without her steering. She was afforded leisure for this function by having all her little wants attended to by Miss Winifred. Meanwhile tiny Miss Noble carried on her arm a small basket, into which she diverted a bit of sugar, which she had first dropped in her saucer as if by mistake, looking round furtively afterwards, and reverting to her teacup with a small innocent noise as of a tiny timid quadruped. Pray think no ill of Miss Noble. That basket held small savings from her more portable food, destined for the children of her poor friends among whom she trotted on fine mornings, fostering and petting all needy creatures being so spontaneous a delight to her, that she regarded it much as if it had been a pleasant vice that she was addicted to. Perhaps she was conscious of being tempted to steal from those who had much that she might give to those who had nothing, and carried in her conscience the guilt of that repressed desire. One must be poor to know the luxury of giving. Mrs. Fairbrother welcomed the guest with a lively formality and precision. She presently informed him that they were not often in want of medical aid in that house. She had brought up her children to wear flannel and not to overeat themselves, which last habit she considered the chief reason why people needed doctors. Lydgate pleaded for those whose fathers and mothers had overeaten themselves, but Mrs. Fairbrother held that view of things dangerous, nature was more just than that, it would be easy for any felon to say that his ancestors ought to have been hanged instead of him. If those who had bad fathers and mothers were bad themselves, they were hanged for that. There was no need to go back on what you couldn't see. My mother is like old George III, said the vicar, she objects to metaphysics. I object to what is wrong, Camden. I say, keep hold of a few plain truths, and make everything square with them. When I was young, Mr. Lydgate, there never was any question about right and wrong. We knew our catechism, and that was enough, we learned our creed and our duty. Every respectable church person had the same opinions. But now, if you speak out of the prayer book itself, you are liable to be contradicted. That makes rather a pleasant time of it for those who like to maintain their own point, said Lydgate. But my mother always gives way, said the vicar, slyly. No, no, Camden, you must not lead Mr. Lydgate into a mistake about me. I shall never show that disrespect to my parents, to give up what they taught me. Anyone may see what comes of turning. If you change once, why not twenty times? A man might see good arguments for changing once, and not see them for changing again, said Lydgate, amused with the decisive old lady. Excuse me there. If you go upon arguments, they are never wanting, when a man has no constancy of mind. My father never changed, and he preached plain moral sermons without arguments, and was a good man, few better. When you get me a good man made out of arguments, I will get you a good dinner with reading you the cookery book. That's my opinion, and I think anybody's stomach will bear me out. About the dinner certainly, mother, said Mr. Fairbrother. It is the same thing, the dinner, or the man. I am nearly seventy, Mr. Lydgate, and I go upon experience. I am not likely to follow new lights, though there are plenty of them here as elsewhere. I say, they came in with the mixed stuffs that will neither wash nor wear. It was not so in my youth, a churchman was a churchman, and a clergyman, you might be pretty sure, was a gentleman, if nothing else. But now he may be no better than a dissenter, and want to push aside my son on pretense of doctrine. But whoever may wish to push him aside, I am proud to say, Mr. Lydgate, that he will compare with any preacher in this kingdom, not to speak of this town, 
which is but a low standard to go by, at least, to my thinking, for I was born and bred at Exeter. A mother is never partial, said Mr. Fairbrother, smiling. What do you think Tyke's mother says about him? Ah, poor creature. What indeed, said Mrs. Fairbrother, her sharpness blunted for the moment by her confidence in maternal judgments. She says the truth to herself, depend upon it. And what is the truth, said Lydgate. I am curious to know. Oh, nothing bad at all, said Mr. Fairbrother. He is a zealous fellow, not very learned, and not very wise, I think, because I don't agree with him. Why, Camden, said Miss Winifred, Griffin and his wife told me only today, that Mr. Tyke said they should have no more coals if they came to hear you preach. Mrs. Fairbrother laid down her knitting, which she had resumed after her small allowance of tea and toast, and looked at her son as if to say, you hear that? Miss Noble said, oh poor things. Poor things, in reference, probably, to the double loss of preaching and coal. But the vicar answered quietly, that is because they are not my parishioners. And I don't think my sermons are worth a load of coals to them. Mr. Lydgate, said Mrs. Fairbrother, who could not let this pass, you don't know my son, he always undervalues himself. I tell him he is undervaluing the God who made him, and made him a most excellent preacher. That must be a hint for me to take Mr. Lydgate away to my study, mother, said the vicar, laughing. I promise to show you my collection, he added, turning to Lydgate, shall we go? All three ladies remonstrated. Mr. Lydgate ought not to be hurried away without being allowed to accept another cup of tea, Miss Winifred had abundance of good tea in the pot. Why was Camden in such haste to take a visitor to his den? There was nothing but pickled vermin, and drawers full of blue bottles and moths, with no carpet on the floor. Mr. Lydgate must excuse it. A game at cribbage would be far better. In short, it was plain that a vicar might be adored by his womankind as the king of men and preachers, and yet be held by them to stand in much need of their direction. Lydgate, with the usual shallowness of a young bachelor, wondered that Mr. Fairbrother had not taught them better. My mother is not used to my having visitors who can take any interest in my hobbies, said the vicar, as he opened the door of his study, which was indeed as bare of luxuries for the body as the ladies had implied, unless a short porcelain pipe and a tobacco box were to be accepted. Men of your profession don't generally smoke, he said. Lydgate smiled and shook his head. Nor of mine either, properly, I suppose. You will hear that pipe alleged against me by Bulstrode and company. They don't know how pleased the devil would be if I gave it up. I understand. You are of an excitable temper and want a sedative. I am heavier, and should get idle with it. I should rush into idleness, and stagnate there with all my might. And you mean to give it all to your work. I am some ten or twelve years older than you, and have come to a compromise. I feed a weakness or two lest they should get clamorous. See, continued the vicar, opening several small drawers, I fancy I have made an exhaustive study of the entomology of this district. I am going on both with the fauna and flora, but I have at least done my insects well. We are singularly rich in orthoptera, I don't know whether, ah. You have got hold of that glass jar, you are looking into that instead of my drawers. You don't really care about these things? Not by the side of this lovely anencephalous monster. I have never had time to give myself much to natural history. I was early bitten with an interest in structure, and it is what lies most directly in my profession. I have no hobby besides. I have the sea to swim in there. Ah! You are a happy fellow, said Mr. Fairbrother, turning on his heel and beginning to fill his pipe. You don't know what it is to want spiritual tobacco, bad emendations of old texts, or small items about a variety of aphis brassicae, with the well-known signature of Philomicron, for the Twaddler's magazine, or a learned treatise on the entomology of the Pentateuch, including all the insects not mentioned, but probably met with by the Israelites in their passage through the desert, 
with a monograph on the ant, as treated by Solomon, showing the harmony of the book of Proverbs with the results of modern research. You don't mind my fumigating you? Lydgate was more surprised at the openness of this talk than at its implied meaning, that the vicar felt himself not altogether in the right vocation. The neat fitting up of drawers and shelves, and the bookcase filled with expensive illustrated books on natural history, made him think again of the winnings at cards and their destination. But he was beginning to wish that the very best construction of everything that Mr. Fairbrother did should be the true one. The vicar's frankness seemed not of the repulsive sort that comes from an uneasy consciousness seeking to forestall the judgment of others, but simply the relief of a desire to do with as little pretense as possible. Apparently he was not without a sense that his freedom of speech might seem premature, for he presently said, I have not yet told you that I have the advantage of you, Mr. Lydgate, and know you better than you know me. You remember Trolley who shared your apartment at Paris for some time? I was a correspondent of his, and he told me a good deal about you. I was not quite sure when you first came that you were the same man. I was very glad when I found that you were. Only I don't forget that you have not had the like prologue about me. Lydgate divined some delicacy of feeling here, but did not half understand it. By the way, he said, what has become of Trolley? I have quite lost sight of him. He was hot on the French social systems, and talked of going to the backwoods to found a sort of Pythagorean community. Is he gone? Not at all. He is practicing at a German bath, and has married a rich patient. Then my notions were the best, so far, said Lydgate, with a short scornful laugh. He would have it, the medical profession was an inevitable system of humbug. I said, the fault was in the men, men who truckle to lies and folly. Instead of preaching against humbug outside the walls, it might be better to set up a disinfecting apparatus within. In short, I am reporting my own conversation, you may be sure I had all the good sense on my side. Your scheme is a good deal more difficult to carry out than the Pythagorean community, though. You have not only got the old Adam in yourself against you, but you have got all those descendants of the original Adam who form the society around you. You see, I have paid twelve or thirteen years more than you for my knowledge of difficulties. But, Mr. Fairbrother broke off a moment, and then added, you are eyeing that glass vase again. Do you want to make an exchange? You shall not have it without a fair barter. I have some sea mice, fine specimens, in spirits. And I will throw in Robert Brown's new thing, microscopic observations on the pollen of plants, if you don't happen to have it already. Why, seeing how you long for the monster, I might ask a higher price. Suppose I ask you to look through my drawers and agree with me about all my new species? The vicar, while he talked in this way, alternately moved about with his pipe in his mouth, and returned to hang rather fondly over his drawers. That would be good discipline, you know, for a young doctor who has to please his patients in Middlemarch. You must learn to be bored, remember. However, you shall have the monster on your own terms. Don't you think men overrate the necessity for humoring everybody's nonsense, till they get despised by the very fools they humor, said Lydgate, moving to Mr. Fairbrother's side, and looking rather absently at the insects ranged in fine gradation, with names subscribed in exquisite writing. The shortest way is to make your value felt, so that people must put up with you whether you flatter them or not. With all my heart. But then you must be sure of having the value and you must keep yourself independent. Very few men can do that. Either you slip out of service altogether, and become good for nothing, or you wear the harness and draw a good deal where your yoke fellows pull you. But do look at these delicate orthoptera. Lydgate had after all to give some scrutiny to each drawer, the vicar laughing at himself, and yet persisting in the exhibition. Apropos of what you said about wearing harness, Lydgate began, after they had sat down, I made up my mind some time ago to do with as little of it as possible. That was why I determined not to try anything in London, for a good many years at least. I didn't like what I saw when I was studying there, 
so much empty bigwigism and obstructive trickery. In the country, people have less pretension to knowledge and are less of companions, but for that reason they affect one's a more proper less, one makes less bad blood, and can follow one's own course more quietly. Yes, well, you have got a good start, you are in the right profession, the work you feel yourself most fit for. Some people miss that, and repent too late. But you must not be too sure of keeping your independence. You mean of family ties, said Lydgate, conceiving that these might press rather tightly on Mr. Fairbrother. Not altogether. Of course they make many things more difficult. But a good wife, a good unworldly woman, may really help a man, and keep him more independent. There's a parishioner of mine, a fine fellow, but who would hardly have pulled through as he has done without his wife. Do you know the Garths? I think they were not Peacock's patients. No, but there is a Miss Garth at Old Featherstones, at Lowick. Their daughter, an excellent girl. She is very quiet, I have hardly noticed her. She has taken notice of you, though, depend upon it. I don't understand, said Lydgate, he could hardly say, of course. Oh, she gauges everybody. I prepared her for confirmation, she is a favorite of mine. Mr. Fairbrother puffed a few moments in silence, Lydgate not caring to know more about the Garths. At last the vicar laid down his pipe, stretched out his legs, and turned his bright eyes with a smile towards Lydgate, saying, but we Middlemarchers are not so tame as you take us to be. We have our intrigues and our parties. I am a party man, for example, and Bulstrode is another. If you vote for me you will offend Bulstrode. What is there against Bulstrode, said Lydgate, emphatically. I did not say there was anything against him except that. If you vote against him you will make him your enemy. I don't know that I need mind about that, said Lydgate, rather proudly, but he seems to have good ideas about hospitals, and he spends large sums on useful public objects. He might help me a good deal in carrying out my ideas. As to his religious notions, why, as Voltaire said, incantations will destroy a flock of sheep if administered with a certain quantity of arsenic. I look for the man who will bring the arsenic, and don't mind about his incantations. Very good. But then you must not offend your arsenic man. You will not offend me, you know, said Mr. Fairbrother, quite unaffectedly. I don't translate my own convenience into other people's duties. I am opposed to Bulstrode in many ways. I don't like the set he belongs to, they are a narrow ignorant set, and do more to make their neighbors uncomfortable than to make them better. Their system is a sort of worldly spiritual cliqueism, they really look on the rest of mankind as a doomed carcass which is to nourish them for heaven. But, he added, smilingly, I don't say that Bulstrode's new hospital is a bad thing, and as to his wanting to oust me from the old one, why, if he thinks me a mischievous fellow, he is only returning a compliment. And I am not a model clergyman, only a decent makeshift. Lydgate was not at all sure that the vicar maligned himself. A model clergyman, like a model doctor, ought to think his own profession the finest in the world, and take all knowledge as mere nourishment to his moral pathology and therapeutics. He only said, what reason does Bulstrode give for superseding you? That I don't teach his opinions, which he calls spiritual religion, and that I have no time to spare. Both statements are true. But then I could make time, and I should be glad of the forty pounds. That is the plain fact of the case. But let us dismiss it. I only wanted to tell you that if you vote for your arsenic man, you are not to cut me in consequence. I can't spare you. You are a sort of circumnavigator come to settle among us, and will keep up my belief in the antipodes. Now tell me all about them in Paris. Chapter 18 Oh, sir, the loftiest hopes on earth draw lots with meaner hopes, heroic breasts, breathing bad air, run risk of pestilence, or, lacking lime juice when they cross the line, may languish with the scurvy. 
Some weeks passed after this conversation before the question of the chaplaincy gathered any practical import for Lydgate, and without telling himself the reason, he deferred the predetermination on which side he should give his vote. It would really have been a matter of total indifference to him, that is to say, he would have taken the more convenient side, and given his vote for the appointment of Tyke without any hesitation, if he had not cared personally for Mr. Fairbrother. But his liking for the vicar of St. Botolph's grew with growing acquaintanceship. That, entering into Lydgate's position as a newcomer who had his own professional objects to secure, Mr. Fairbrother should have taken pains rather to warn off than to obtain his interest, showed an unusual delicacy and generosity, which Lydgate's nature was keenly alive to. It went along with other points of conduct in Mr. Fairbrother which were exceptionally fine, and made his character resemble those southern landscapes which seem divided between natural grandeur and social slovenliness. Very few men could have been as filial and chivalrous as he was to the mother, aunt, and sister, whose dependence on him had in many ways shaped his life rather uneasily for himself, few men who feel the pressure of small needs are so nobly resolute not to dress up their inevitably self-interested desires in a pretext of better motives. In these matters he was conscious that his life would bear the closest scrutiny, and perhaps the consciousness encouraged a little defiance towards the critical strictness of persons whose celestial intimacies seemed not to improve their domestic manners, and whose lofty aims were not needed to account for their actions. Then, his preaching was ingenious and pithy, like the preaching of the English church in its robust age, and his sermons were delivered without book. People outside his parish went to hear him, and, since to fill the church was always the most difficult part of a clergyman's function, here was another ground for a careless sense of superiority. Besides, he was a likable man, sweet-tempered, ready-witted, frank, without grins of suppressed bitterness or other conversational flavors which make half of us an affliction to our friends. Lydgate liked him heartily, and wished for his friendship. With this feeling uppermost, he continued to waive the question of the chaplaincy, and to persuade himself that it was not only no proper business of his, but likely enough never to vex him with a demand for his vote. Lydgate, at Mr. Bulstrode's request, was laying down plans for the internal arrangements of the new hospital, and the two were often in consultation. The banker was always presupposing that he could count in general on Lydgate as a coadjutor, but made no special recurrence to the coming decision between Tyke and Fairbrother. When the general board of the infirmary had met, however, and Lydgate had noticed that the question of the chaplaincy was thrown on a council of the directors and medical men, to meet on the following Friday, he had a vexed sense that he must make up his mind on this trivial Middlemarch business. He could not help hearing within him the distinct declaration that Bulstrode was Prime Minister, and that the Tyke affair was a question of office or no office, and he could not help an equally pronounced dislike to giving up the prospect of office. For his observation was constantly confirming Mr. Fairbrother's assurance that the banker would not overlook opposition. Confound their petty politics, was one of his thoughts for three mornings in the meditative process of shaving, when he had begun to feel that he must really hold a court of conscience on this matter. Certainly there were valid things to be said against the election of Mr. Fairbrother, he had too much on his hands already, especially considering how much time he spent on non-clerical occupations. Then again it was a continually repeated shock, disturbing Lydgate's esteem, that the vicar should obviously play for the sake of money, liking the play indeed, but evidently liking some end which it served. Mr. Fairbrother contended on theory for the desirability of all games, and said that Englishman's wit was stagnant for want of them, but Lydgate felt certain that he would have played very much less but for the money. There was a billiard room at the Green Dragon, which some anxious mothers and wives regarded as the chief temptation in Middlemarch. The vicar was a first-rate billiard player, and though he did not frequent the Green Dragon, there were reports that he had sometimes been there in the daytime and had won money. And as to the chaplaincy, he did not pretend that he cared for it, except for the sake of the forty pounds. Lydgate was no Puritan, but he did not care for play, and winning money at it had always seemed a meanness to him, besides, 
he had an ideal of life which made this subservience of conduct to the gaining of small sums thoroughly hateful to him. Hitherto in his own life his wants had been supplied without any trouble to himself, and his first impulse was always to be liberal with half-crowns as matters of no importance to a gentleman, it had never occurred to him to devise a plan for getting half-crowns. He had always known in a general way that he was not rich, but he had never felt poor, and he had no power of imagining the part which the want of money plays in determining the actions of men. Money had never been a motive to him. Hence he was not ready to frame excuses for this deliberate pursuit of small gains. It was altogether repulsive to him, and he never entered into any calculation of the ratio between the vicar's income and his more or less necessary expenditure. It was possible that he would not have made such a calculation in his own case. And now, when the question of voting had come, this repulsive fact told more strongly against Mr. Fairbrother than it had done before. One would know much better what to do if men's characters were more consistent, and especially if one's friends were invariably fit for any function they desired to undertake. Lydgate was convinced that if there had been no valid objection to Mr. Fairbrother, he would have voted for him, whatever Bulstrode might have felt on the subject, he did not intend to be a vassal of Bulstrode's. On the other hand, there was Tyke, a man entirely given to his clerical office, who was simply curate at a chapel of ease in St. Peter's Parish, and had time for extra duty. Nobody had anything to say against Mr. Tyke, except that they could not bear him, and suspected him of cant. Really, from his point of view, Bulstrode was thoroughly justified. But whichever way Lydgate began to incline, there was something to make him wince, and being a proud man, he was a little exasperated at being obliged to wince. He did not like frustrating his own best purposes by getting on bad terms with Bulstrode, he did not like voting against Fairbrother, and helping to deprive him of function and salary, and the question occurred whether the additional forty pounds might not leave the vicar free from that ignoble care about winning at cards. Moreover, Lydgate did not like the consciousness that in voting for Tyke he should be voting on the side obviously convenient for himself. But would the end really be his own convenience? Other people would say so, and would allege that he was currying favor with Bulstrode for the sake of making himself important and getting on in the world. What then? He for his own part knew that if his personal prospects simply had been concerned, he would not have cared a rotten nut for the banker's friendship or enmity. What he really cared for was a medium for his work, a vehicle for his ideas, and after all, was he not bound to prefer the object of getting a good hospital, where he could demonstrate the specific distinctions of fever and test therapeutic results, before anything else connected with this chaplaincy? For the first time Lydgate was feeling the hampering thread-like pressure of small social conditions, and their frustrating complexity. At the end of his inward debate, when he set out for the hospital, his hope was really in the chance that discussion might somehow give a new aspect to the question, and make the scale dip so as to exclude the necessity for voting. I think he trusted a little also to the energy which is begotten by circumstances, some feeling rushing warmly and making resolve easy, while debate in cool blood had only made it more difficult. However it was, he did not distinctly say to himself on which side he would vote, and all the while he was inwardly resenting the subjection which had been forced upon him. It would have seemed beforehand like a ridiculous piece of bad logic that he, with his unmixed resolutions of independence and his select purposes, would find himself at the very outset in the grasp of petty alternatives, each of which was repugnant to him. In his students' chambers, he had prearranged his social action quite differently. Lydgate was late in setting out, but Dr. Sprague, the two other surgeons, and several of the directors had arrived early, Mr. Bulstrode, treasurer and chairman, being among those who were still absent. The conversation seemed to imply that the issue was problematical, and that a majority for Tyke was not so certain as had been generally supposed. The two physicians, for a wonder, turned out to be unanimous, or rather, though of different minds, they concurred in action. Dr. Sprague, the rugged and weighty, was, as everyone had foreseen, an adherent of Mr. Fairbrother. The doctor was more than suspected of having no religion, 
but somehow Middlemarch tolerated this deficiency in him as if he had been a Lord Chancellor, indeed it is probable that his professional weight was the more believed in, the world-old association of cleverness with the evil principle being still potent in the minds even of lady patients who had the strictest ideas of frilling and sentiment. It was perhaps this negation in the doctor which made his neighbors call him hard-headed and dry-witted, conditions of texture which were also held favorable to the storing of judgments connected with drugs. At all events, it is certain that if any medical man had come to Middlemarch with the reputation of having very definite religious views, of being given to prayer, and of otherwise showing an active piety, there would have been a general presumption against his medical skill. On this ground it was, professionally speaking, fortunate for Dr. Minchin that his religious sympathies were of a general kind, and such as gave a distant medical sanction to all serious sentiment, whether of church or dissent, rather than any adhesion to particular tenets. If Mr. Bulstrode insisted, as he was appointment to do, on the Lutheran doctrine of justification, as that by which a church must stand or fall, Dr. Minchin in return was quite sure that man was not a mere machine or a fortuitous conjunction of atoms, if Mrs. Wimple insisted on a particular providence in relation to her stomach complaint, Dr. Minchin for his part liked to keep the mental windows open and objected to fixed limits, if the Unitarian brewer jested about the Athanasian creed, Dr. Minchin quoted Pope's essay on man. He objected to the rather free style of anecdote in which Dr. Sprague indulged, preferring well-sanctioned quotations, and liking refinement of all kinds, it was generally known that he had some kinship to a bishop and sometimes spent his holidays at the palace. Dr. Minchin was soft-handed, pale-complexioned, and of rounded outline, not to be distinguished from a mild clergyman in appearance, whereas Dr. Sprague was superfluously tall. His trousers got creased at the knees, and showed an excess of boot at a time when straps seemed necessary to any dignity of bearing, you heard him go in and out, and up and down, as if he had come to see after the roofing. In short, he had weight, and might be expected to grapple with a disease and throw it, while Dr. Minchin might be better able to detect it lurking and to circumvent it. They enjoyed about equally the mysterious privilege of medical reputation, and concealed with much etiquette their contempt for each other's skill. Regarding themselves as Middlemarch institutions, they were ready to combine against all innovators, and against non-professionals given to interference. On this ground they were both in their hearts equally averse to Mr. Bulstrode, though Dr. Minchin had never been in open hostility with him, and never differed from him without elaborate explanation to Mrs. Bulstrode, who had found that Dr. Minchin alone understood her constitution. A layman who pried into the professional conduct of medical men, and was always obtruding his reforms, though he was less directly embarrassing to the two physicians than to the surgeon apothecaries who attended paupers by contract, was nevertheless offensive to the professional nostril as such, and Dr. Minchin shared fully in the new peak against Bulstrode, excited by his apparent determination to patronize Lydgate. The long-established practitioners, Mr. Wrench and Mr. Toller, were just now standing apart and having a friendly colloquy, in which they agreed that Lydgate was a jackanapes, just made to serve Bulstrode's purpose. To non-medical friends they had already concurred in praising the other young practitioner, who had come into the town on Mr. Peacock's retirement without further recommendation than his own merits and such argument for solid professional acquirement as might be gathered from his having apparently wasted no time on other branches of knowledge. It was clear that Lydgate, by not dispensing drugs, intended to cast imputations on his equals, and also to obscure the limit between his own rank as a general practitioner and that of the physicians, who, in the interest of the profession, felt bound to maintain its various grades, especially against a man who had not been to either of the English universities and enjoyed the absence of anatomical and bedside study there, but came with a libelous pretension to experience in Edinburgh and Paris, where observation might be abundant indeed, but hardly sound. Thus it happened that on this occasion Bulstrode became identified with Lydgate, and Lydgate with Tyke, and owing to this variety of interchangeable names for the chaplaincy question, diverse minds were enabled to form the same judgment concerning it. 
Dr. Sprague said at once bluntly to the group assembled when he entered, I go for fair brother. A salary, with all my heart. But why take it from the vicar? He has none too much, has to insure his life, besides keeping house, and doing a vicar's charities. Put forty pounds in his pocket and you'll do no harm. He's a good fellow, is fair brother, with as little of the parson about him as will serve to carry orders. Ho, ho. Doctor, said old Mr. Powderell, a retired ironmonger of some standing, his interjection being something between a laugh and a parliamentary disapproval, we must let you have your say. But what we have to consider is not anybody's income, it's the souls of the poor sick people, here Mr. Powderell's voice and face had a sincere pathos in them. He is a real gospel preacher, is Mr. Tyke. I should vote against my conscience if I voted against Mr. Tyke, should indeed. Mr. Tyke's opponents have not asked anyone to vote against his conscience, I believe, said Mr. Hackbutt, a rich tanner of fluent speech, whose glittering spectacles and erect hair were turned with some severity towards innocent Mr. Powderell. But in my judgment it behoves us, as directors, to consider whether we will regard it as our whole business to carry out propositions emanating from a single quarter. Will any member of the committee aver that he would have entertained the idea of displacing the gentleman who has always discharged the function of chaplain here, if it had not been suggested to him by parties whose disposition it is to regard every institution of this town as a machinery for carrying out their own views? I tax no man's motives, let them lie between himself and a higher power, but I do say, that there are influences at work here which are incompatible with genuine independence, and that a crawling servility is usually dictated by circumstances which gentlemen so conducting themselves could not afford either morally or financially to avow. I myself am a layman, but I have given no inconsiderable attention to the divisions in the church and, oh, damn the divisions, burst in Mr. Frank Hawley, lawyer and town clerk, who rarely presented himself at the board, but now looked in hurriedly, whip in hand. We have nothing to do with them here. Fair brother has been doing the work, what there was, without pay, and if pay is to be given, it should be given to him. I call it a confounded job to take the thing away from fair brother. I think it would be as well for gentlemen not to give their remarks a personal bearing, said Mr. Plymdale. I shall vote for the appointment of Mr. Tyke, but I should not have known, if Mr. Hackbutt hadn't hinted it, that I was a servile crawler. I disclaim any personalities. I expressly said, if I may be allowed to repeat, or even to conclude what I was about to say, ah, here's Minchin, said Mr. Frank Hawley, at which everybody turned away from Mr. Hackbutt, leaving him to feel the uselessness of superior gifts in Middlemarch. Come, doctor, I must have you on the right side, eh? I hope so, said Dr. Minchin, nodding and shaking hands here and there, at whatever cost to my feelings. If there's any feeling here, it should be feeling for the man who is turned out, I think, said Mr. Frank Hawley. I confess I have feelings on the other side also. I have a divided esteem, said Dr. Minchin, rubbing his hands. I consider Mr. Tyke an exemplary man, none more so, and I believe him to be proposed from unimpeachable motives. I, for my part, wish that I could give him my vote. But I am constrained to take a view of the case which gives the preponderance to Mr. Fairbrother's claims. He is an amiable man, an able preacher, and has been longer among us. Old Mr. Powderell looked on, sad and silent. Mr. Plymdale settled his cravat, uneasily. You don't set up Fairbrother as a pattern of what a clergyman ought to be, I hope, said Mr. Larcher, the eminent carrier, who had just come in. I have no ill will towards him, but I think we owe something to the public, not to speak of anything higher, in these appointments. In my opinion fair brother is too lax for a clergyman. I don't wish to bring up particulars against him, but he will make a little attendance here go as far as he can. And a devilish deal better than too much, said Mr. Hawley, whose bad language was notorious in that part of the county. Sick people can't bear so much praying and preaching. And that methodistical sort of religion is bad for the spirits, bad for the inside, eh, 
he added, turning quickly round to the four medical men who were assembled. But any answer was dispensed with by the entrance of three gentlemen, with whom there were greetings more or less cordial. These were the Reverend Edward Thesiger, Rector of St. Peter's, Mr. Bolstrode, and our friend Mr. Brook of Tipton, who had lately allowed himself to be put on the board of directors in his turn, but had never before attended, his attendance now being due to Mr. Bolstrode's exertions. Lydgate was the only person still expected. Everyone now sat down, Mr. Bolstrode presiding, pale and self-restrained as usual. Mr. Thesiger, a moderate evangelical, wished for the appointment of his friend Mr. Tyke, a zealous able man, who, officiating at a chapel of ease, had not a cure of souls too extensive to leave him ample time for the new duty. It was desirable that chaplaincies of this kind should be entered on with a fervent intention, they were peculiar opportunities for spiritual influence, and while it was good that a salary should be allotted, there was the more need for scrupulous watching lest the office should be perverted into a mere question of salary. Mr. Thesiger's manner had so much quiet propriety that objectors could only simmer in silence. Mr. Brooke believed that everybody meant well in the matter. He had not himself attended to the affairs of the infirmary, though he had a strong interest in whatever was for the benefit of Middlemarch, and was most happy to meet the gentleman present on any public question, any public question, you know, Mr. Brooke repeated, with his nod of perfect understanding. I am a good deal occupied as a magistrate, and in the collection of documentary evidence, but I regard my time as being at the disposal of the public, and, in short, my friends have convinced me that a chaplain with a salary, a salary, you know, is a very good thing, and I am happy to be able to come here and vote for the appointment of Mr. Tyke, who, I understand, is an unexceptionable man, apostolic and eloquent and everything of that kind, and I am the last man to withhold my vote, under the circumstances, you know. It seems to me that you have been crammed with one side of the question, Mr. Brook, said Mr. Frank Hawley, who was afraid of nobody, and was a Tory suspicious of electioneering intentions. You don't seem to know that one of the worthiest men we have has been doing duty as chaplain here for years without pay, and that Mr. Tyke is proposed to supersede him. Excuse me, Mr. Hawley, said Mr. Bolstrode. Mr. Brook has been fully informed of Mr. Fairbrother's character and position. By his enemies, flashed out Mr. Hawley. I trust there is no personal hostility concerned here, said Mr. Thesiger. I'll swear there is, though, retorted Mr. Hawley. Gentlemen, said Mr. Bolstrode, in a subdued tone, the merits of the question may be very briefly stated, and if any one present doubts that every gentleman who is about to give his vote has not been fully informed, I can now recapitulate the considerations that should weigh on either side. I don't see the good of that, said Mr. Hawley. I suppose we all know whom we mean to vote for. Any man who wants to do justice does not wait till the last minute to hear both sides of the question. I have no time to lose, and I propose that the matter be put to the vote at once. A brief but still hot discussion followed before each person wrote, Tyke or Fairbrother, on a piece of paper and slipped it into a glass tumbler, and in the meantime Mr. Bolstrode saw Lydgate enter. I perceive that the votes are equally divided at present, said Mr. Bolstrode, in a clear biting voice. Then, looking up at Lydgate, there is a casting vote still to be given. It is yours, Mr. Lydgate, will you be good enough to write? The thing is settled now, said Mr. Wrench, rising. We all know how Mr. Lydgate will vote. You seem to speak with some peculiar meaning, sir, said Lydgate, rather defiantly, and keeping his pencil suspended. I merely mean that you are expected to vote with Mr. Bolstrode. Do you regard that meaning as offensive? It may be offensive to others. But I shall not desist from voting with him on that account. Lydgate immediately wrote down, Tyke. So the Reverend Walter Tyke became chaplain to the infirmary, and Lydgate continued to work with Mr. Bolstrode. He was really uncertain whether Tyke were not the more suitable candidate, and yet his consciousness told him that if he had been quite free from indirect bias he should have voted for Mr. Fairbrother. 
The affair of the chaplaincy remained a sore point in his memory as a case in which this petty medium of Middlemarch had been too strong for him. How could a man be satisfied with a decision between such alternatives and under such circumstances? No more than he can be satisfied with his hat, which he has chosen from among such shapes as the resources of the age offer him, wearing it at best with a resignation which is chiefly supported by comparison. But Mr. Fairbrother met him with the same friendliness as before. The character of the publican and sinner is not always practically incompatible with that of the modern Pharisee, for the majority of us scarcely see more distinctly the faultiness of our own conduct than the faultiness of our own arguments, or the dullness of our own jokes. But the vicar of St. Botolph's had certainly escaped the slightest tincture of the Pharisee, and by dint of admitting to himself that he was too much as other men were, he had become remarkably unlike them in this, that he could excuse others for thinking slightly of him, and could judge impartially of their conduct even when it told against him. The world has been too strong for me, I know, he said one day to Lydgate. But then I am not a mighty man, I shall never be a man of renown. The choice of Hercules is a pretty fable, but Prodicus makes it easy work for the hero, as if the first resolves were enough. Another story says that he came to hold the distaff, and at last wore the Nessus shirt. I suppose one good resolve might keep a man right if everybody else's resolve helped him. The vicar's talk was not always inspiriting, he had escaped being a Pharisee, but he had not escaped that low estimate of possibilities which we rather hastily arrive at as an inference from our own failure. Lydgate thought that there was a pitiable infirmity of will in Mr. Fairbrother. Chapter 19 L. Ultra Vidit ch ha fato alla guancia della sua palma, sosperando, leto. Purgatorio, 7. When George IV was still reigning over the privacies of Windsor, when the Duke of Wellington was Prime Minister, and Mr. Vinci was mayor of the old corporation in Middlemarch, Mrs. Casaubon, born Dorothea Brooke, had taken her wedding journey to Rome. In those days the world in general was more ignorant of good and evil by forty years than it is at present. Travelers did not often carry full information on Christian art either in their heads or their pockets, and even the most brilliant English critic of the day mistook the flower-flushed tomb of the Ascended Virgin for an ornamental vase due to the painter's fancy. Romanticism, which has helped to fill some dull blanks with love and knowledge, had not yet penetrated the times with its leaven and entered into everybody's food, it was fermenting still as a distinguishable vigorous enthusiasm in certain long-haired German artists at Rome, and the youth of other nations who worked or idled near them were sometimes caught in the spreading movement. One fine morning a young man whose hair was not immoderately long, but abundant and curly, and who was otherwise English in his equipment, had just turned his back on the Belvedere torso in the Vatican and was looking out on the magnificent view of the mountains from the adjoining round vestibule. He was sufficiently absorbed not to notice the approach of a dark-eyed, animated German who came up to him and placing a hand on his shoulder, said with a strong accent, Come here, quick. Else she will have changed her pose. Quickness was ready at the call, and the two figures passed lightly along by the Meliager, towards the hall where the reclining Ariadne, then called the Cleopatra, lies in the marble voluptuousness of her beauty, the drapery folding around her with a petal-like ease and tenderness. They were just in time to see another figure standing against a pedestal near the reclining marble, a breathing blooming girl, whose form, not shamed by the Ariadne, was clad in Quakerish grey drapery, her long cloak, fastened at the neck, was thrown backward from her arms, and one beautiful unloved hand pillowed her cheek, pushing somewhat backward the white beaver bonnet which made a sort of halo to her face around the simply braided dark brown hair. She was not looking at the sculpture, probably not thinking of it, her large eyes were fixed dreamily on a streak of sunlight which fell across the floor. But she became conscious of the two strangers who suddenly paused as if to contemplate the Cleopatra, and, without looking at them, immediately turned away to join a maid-servant and courier who were loitering along the hall at a little distance off. What do you think of that for a fine bit of antithesis, said the German, searching in his friend's face for responding admiration, 
but going on volubly without waiting for any other answer. There lies antique beauty, not corpse-like even in death, but arrested in the complete contentment of its sensuous perfection, and here stands beauty in its breathing life, with the consciousness of Christian centuries in its bosom. But she should be dressed as a nun, I think she looks almost what you call a Quaker, I would dress her as a nun in my picture. However, she is married, I saw her wedding ring on that wonderful left hand, otherwise I should have thought the sallow Geistlicher was her father. I saw him parting from her a good while ago, and just now I found her in that magnificent pose. Only think. He is perhaps rich, and would like to have her portrait taken. Ah. It is no use looking after her, there she goes. Let us follow her home. No, no, said his companion, with a little frown. You are singular, Ladislaw. You look struck together. Do you know her? I know that she is married to my cousin, said Will Ladislaw, sauntering down the hall with a preoccupied air, while his German friend kept at his side and watched him eagerly. What? The Geistlicher? He looks more like an uncle, a more useful sort of relation. He is not my uncle. I tell you he is my second cousin, said Ladislaw, with some irritation. Sean, Sean. Don't be snappish. You are not angry with me for thinking Mrs. Second Cousin the most perfect young Madonna I ever saw? Angry? Nonsense. I have only seen her once before, for a couple of minutes, when my cousin introduced her to me, just before I left England. They were not married then. I didn't know they were coming to Rome. But you will go to see them now, you will find out what they have for an address, since you know the name. Shall we go to the post? And you could speak about the portrait. Confound you, Nauman. I don't know what I shall do. I am not so brazen as you. Bah! That is because you are dilettantish and amateurish. If you were an artist, you would think of Mistress Second Cousin as antique form animated by Christian sentiment, a sort of Christian antigone, sensuous force controlled by spiritual passion. Yes, and that your painting her was the chief outcome of her existence, the divinity passing into higher completeness and all but exhausted in the act of covering your bit of canvas. I am amateurish if you like, I do not think that all the universe is straining towards the obscure significance of your pictures. But it is, my dear, so far as it is straining through me, Adolf Naumann, that stands firm, said the good-natured painter, putting a hand on Ladislaw's shoulder, and not in the least disturbed by the unaccountable touch of ill-humor in his tone. See now. My existence presupposes the existence of the whole universe, does it not? And my function is to paint, and as a painter I have a conception which is altogether genialish, of your great-aunt or second-grandmother as a subject for a picture, therefore, the universe is straining towards that picture through that particular hook or claw which it puts forth in the shape of me, not true? But how if another claw in the shape of me is straining to thwart it, the case is a little less simple then. Not at all, the result of the struggle is the same thing, picture or no picture, logically. Will could not resist this imperturbable temper, and the cloud in his face broke into sunshiny laughter. Come now, my friend, you will help, said Nauman, in a hopeful tone. No, nonsense, Nauman. English ladies are not at everybody's service as models. And you want to express too much with your painting. You would only have made a better or worse portrait with a background which every connoisseur would give a different reason for or against. And what is a portrait of a woman? Your painting and plastic are poor stuff after all. They perturb and dull conceptions instead of raising them. Language is a finer medium. Yes, for those who can't paint, said Nauman. There you have perfect right. I did not recommend you to paint, my friend. The amiable artist carried his sting, but Ladislaw did not choose to appear stung. He went on as if he had not heard. Language gives a fuller image, which is all the better for being vague. After all, the true seeing is within, 
and painting stares at you with an insistent imperfection. I feel that especially about representations of women. As if a woman were a mere colored superficies. You must wait for movement and tone. There is a difference in their very breathing, they change from moment to moment. This woman whom you have just seen, for example, how would you paint her voice, pray? But her voice is much diviner than anything you have seen of her. I see, I see. You are jealous. No man must presume to think that he can paint your ideal. This is serious, my friend. Your great aunt. Dernef A.L.S. uncle, in a tragic sense, unsure. You and I shall quarrel, Nauman, if you call that lady my aunt again. How is she to be called then? Mrs. Kasabin. Good. Suppose I get acquainted with her in spite of you, and find that she very much wishes to be painted? Yes, suppose, said Will Ladislaw, in a contemptuous undertone, intended to dismiss the subject. He was conscious of being irritated by ridiculously small causes, which were half of his own creation. Why was he making any fuss about Mrs. Kasabin? And yet he felt as if something had happened to him with regard to her. There are characters which are continually creating collisions and nodes for themselves in dramas which nobody is prepared to act with them. Their susceptibilities will clash against objects that remain innocently quiet. Chapter 20 a child forsaken, waking suddenly, whose gaze afeared on all things round doth rove, and seeth only that it cannot see the meeting eyes of love. Two hours later, Dorothea was seated in an inner room or boudoir of a handsome apartment in the Via Sistina. I am sorry to add that she was sobbing bitterly, with such abandonment to this relief of an oppressed heart as a woman habitually controlled by pride on her own account and thoughtfulness for others will sometimes allow herself when she feels securely alone. And Mr. Kasabin was certain to remain away for some time at the Vatican. Yet Dorothea had no distinctly Chopin grievance that she could state even to herself, and in the midst of her confused thought and passion, the mental act that was struggling forth into clearness was a self-accusing cry that her feeling of desolation was the fault of her own spiritual poverty. She had married the man of her choice, and with the advantage over most girls that she had contemplated her marriage chiefly as the beginning of new duties, from the very first she had thought of Mr. Kasabin as having a mind so much above her own, that he must often be claimed by studies which she could not entirely share, moreover, after the brief narrow experience of her girlhood she was beholding Rome, the city of visible history, where the past of a whole hemisphere seems moving in funeral. Procession with strange ancestral images and trophies gathered from afar. But this stupendous fragmentariness heightened the dreamlike strangeness of her bridal life. Dorothea had now been five weeks in Rome, and in the kindly mornings when autumn and winter seemed to go hand in hand like a happy aged couple one of whom would presently survive in chiller loneliness, she had driven about at first with Mr. Kasabin, but of late chiefly with Tantrip and their experienced courier. She had been led through the best galleries, had been taken to the chief points of view, had been shown the grandest ruins and the most glorious churches, and she had ended by oftenest choosing to drive out to the Campania where she could feel alone with the earth and sky, away from the oppressive masquerade of ages, in which her own life too seemed to become a mask with enigmatical costumes. To those who have looked at Rome with the quickening power of a knowledge which breathes a growing soul into all historic shapes, and traces out the suppressed transitions which unite all contrasts, Rome may still be the spiritual center and interpreter of the world. But let them conceive one more historical contrast, the gigantic broken revelations of that imperial and papal city thrust abruptly on the notions of a girl who had been brought up in English and Swiss Puritanism, fed on meager Protestant histories and on art chiefly of the hand-screen sort, a girl whose ardent nature turned all her small allowance of knowledge into principles, fusing her actions into their mold, and whose quick emotions gave the most abstract things the quality of a pleasure. Or a pain, a girl who had lately become a wife, and from the enthusiastic acceptance of untried duty found herself plunged in tumultuous preoccupation with her personal lot. 
The weight of unintelligible Rome might lie easily on bright nymphs to whom it formed a background for the brilliant picnic of Anglo-foreign society, but Dorothea had no such defense against deep impressions. Ruins and basilicas, palaces and colossi, set in the midst of a sordid present, where all that was living and warm-blooded seemed sunk in the deep degeneracy of a superstition divorced from reverence, the dimmer but yet eager titanic life gazing and struggling on walls and ceilings, the long vistas of white forms whose marble eyes seemed to hold the monotonous light of an alien world, all this vast wreck of ambitious ideals, sensuous and spiritual, mixed confusedly with the signs of breathing. Forgetfulness and degradation, at first jarred her as with an electric shock, and then urged themselves on her with that ache belonging to a glut of confused ideas which check the flow of emotion. Forms both pale and glowing took possession of her young sense, and fixed themselves in her memory even when she was not thinking of them, preparing strange associations which remained through her after years. Our moods are apt to bring with them images which succeed each other like the magic lantern pictures of a doze, and in certain states of dull forlornness Dorothea all her life continued to see the vastness of St. Peter's, the huge bronze canopy, the excited intention in the attitudes and garments of the prophets and evangelists in the mosaics above, and the red drapery which was being hung for Christmas spreading itself everywhere like a disease of the retina. Not that this inward amazement of Dorothea's was anything very exceptional, many souls in their young nudity are tumbled out among incongruities and left to find their feet among them while their elders go about their business. Nor can I suppose that when Mrs. Kasabin is discovered in a fit of weeping six weeks after her wedding, the situation will be regarded as tragic. Some discouragement, some faintness of heart at the new real future which replaces the imaginary, is not unusual, and we do not expect people to be deeply moved by what is not unusual. That element of tragedy which lies in the very fact of frequency, has not yet wrought itself into the coarse emotion of mankind, and perhaps our frames could hardly bear much of it. If we had a keen vision and feeling of all ordinary human life, it would be like hearing the grass grow and the squirrel's heart beat, and we should die of that roar which lies on the other side of silence. As it is, the quickest of us walk about well wadded with stupidity. However, Dorothea was crying, and if she had been required to state the cause, she could only have done so in some such general words as I have already used, to have been driven to be more particular would have been like trying to give a history of the lights and shadows, for that new real future which was replacing the imaginary drew its material from the endless minutiae by which her view of Mr. Kasabin and her wifely relation, now that she was married to him, was gradually changing with the secret motion of a watch hand from what it had been in her maiden dream. It was too early yet for her fully to recognize or at least admit the change, still more for her to have readjusted that devotedness which was so necessary a part of her mental life that she was almost sure sooner or later to recover it. Permanent rebellion, the disorder of a life without some loving reverent resolve, was not possible to her but she was now in an interval when the very force of her nature heightened its confusion. In this way, the early months of marriage often are times of critical tumult, whether that of a shrimp pool or of deeper waters, which afterward subsides into cheerful peace. But was not Mr. Kasabin just as learned as before? Had his forms of expression changed, or his sentiments become less laudable? O oh, waywardness of womanhood! Did his chronology fail him, or his ability to state not only a theory but the names of those who held it, or his provision for giving the heads of any subject on demand? And was not Rome the place in all the world to give free play to such accomplishments? Besides, had not Dorothea's enthusiasm especially dwelt on the prospect of relieving the weight and perhaps the sadness with which great tasks lie on him who has to achieve them, and that such weight pressed on Mr. Kasabin was only plainer than before? All these are crushing questions, but whatever else remained the same, the light had changed, and you cannot find the pearly dawn at noonday. The fact is unalterable, that a fellow mortal with whose nature you are acquainted solely through the brief entrances and exits of a few imaginative weeks called courtship, may, 
when seen in the continuity of married companionship, be disclosed as something better or worse than what you have preconceived, but will certainly not appear altogether the same. And it would be astonishing to find how soon the change is felt if we had no kindred changes to compare with it. To share lodgings with a brilliant dinner companion, or to see your favorite politician in the ministry, may bring about changes quite as rapid, in these cases too we begin by knowing little and believing much, and we sometimes end by inverting the quantities. Still, such comparisons might mislead, for no man was more incapable of flashy make-believe than Mr. Kasabin, he was as genuine a character as any ruminant animal, and he had not actively assisted in creating any illusions about himself. How was it that in the weeks since her marriage, Dorothea had not distinctly observed but felt with a stifling depression, that the large vistas and wide fresh air which she had dreamed of finding in her husband's mind were replaced by anterooms and winding passages which seemed to lead no whither. I suppose it was that in courtship everything is regarded as provisional and preliminary, and the smallest sample of virtue or accomplishment is taken to guarantee delightful stores which the broad leisure of marriage will reveal. But the door sill of marriage once crossed, expectation is concentrated on the present. Having once embarked on your marital voyage, it is impossible not to be aware that you make no way and that the sea is not within sight, that, in fact, you are exploring an enclosed basin. In their conversation before marriage, Mr. Kasabin had often dwelt on some explanation or questionable detail of which Dorothea did not see the bearing, but such imperfect coherence seemed due to the brokenness of their intercourse, and, supported by her faith in their future, she had listened with fervid patience to a recitation of possible arguments to be brought against Mr. Kasabin's entirely new view of the Philistine god Dagon and other fish deities, thinking that hereafter she should see this subject which touched him so nearly from the same high ground whence doubtless it had become so important to him. Again, the matter-of-course statement and tone of dismissal with which he treated what to her were the most stirring thoughts, was easily accounted for as belonging to the sense of haste and preoccupation in which she herself shared during their engagement. But now, since they had been in Rome, with all the depths of her emotion roused to tumultuous activity, and with life made a new problem by new elements, she had been becoming more and more aware, with a certain terror, that her mind was continually sliding into inward fits of anger and repulsion, or else into forlorn weariness. How far the judicious hooker or any other hero of erudition would have been the same at Mr. Kasabin's time of life, she had no means of knowing, so that he could not have the advantage of comparison, but her husband's way of commenting on the strangely impressive objects around them had begun to affect her with a sort of mental shiver, he had perhaps the best intention of acquitting himself worthily but only of acquitting himself. What was fresh to her mind was worn out to his, and such capacity of thought and feeling as had ever been stimulated in him by the general life of mankind had long shrunk to a sort of dried preparation, a lifeless embalmment of knowledge. When he said, Does this interest you, Dorothea? Shall we stay a little longer? I am ready to stay if you wish it, it seemed to her as if going or staying were alike dreary. Or, should you like to go to the Farnesina, Dorothea? It contains celebrated frescoes designed or painted by Raphael, which most persons think it worth while to visit. But do you care about them, was always Dorothea's question. They are, I believe, highly esteemed. Some of them represent the fable of Cupid and Psyche, which is probably the romantic invention of a literary period, and cannot, I think, be reckoned as a genuine mythical product. But if you like these wall paintings we can easily drive thither, and you will then, I think, have seen the chief works of Raphael, any of which it were a pity to omit in a visit to Rome. He is the painter who has been held to combine the most complete grace of form with sublimity of expression. Such at least I have gathered to be the opinion of Conoscenti. This kind of answer given in a measured official tone, as of a clergyman reading according to the rubric, did not help to justify the glories of the Eternal City, or to give her the hope that if she knew more about them the world would be joyously illuminated for her. There is hardly any contact more depressing to a young ardent creature than that of a mind in which years full of knowledge seem to have issued in a blank absence of interest or sympathy. 
On other subjects indeed Mr. Kasabin showed a tenacity of occupation and an eagerness which are usually regarded as the effect of enthusiasm, and Dorothea was anxious to follow this spontaneous direction of his thoughts, instead of being made to feel that she dragged him away from it. But she was gradually ceasing to expect with her former delightful confidence that she should see any wide opening where she followed him. Poor Mr. Kasabin himself was lost among small closets and winding stairs, and in an agitated dimness about the Kaberi, or in an exposure of other mythologists' ill-considered parallels, easily lost sight of any purpose which had prompted him to these labors. With his taper stuck before him he forgot the absence of windows, and in bitter manuscript remarks on other men's notions about the solar deities, he had become indifferent to the sunlight. These characteristics, fixed and unchangeable as bone in Mr. Kasabin, might have remained longer unfelt by Dorothea if she had been encouraged to pour forth her girlish and womanly feeling, if he would have held her hands between his and listened with the delight of tenderness and understanding to all the little histories which made up her experience, and would have given her the same sort of intimacy in return, so that the past life of each could be included in their mutual knowledge and affection or if she could have fed her affection with those childlike caresses which are the bent of every sweet woman, who has begun by showering kisses on the hard pate of her bald doll. Creating a happy soul within that woodenness from the wealth of her own love. That was Dorothea's bent. With all her yearning to know what was afar from her and to be widely benignant, she had ardor enough for what was near, to have kissed Mr. Kasabin's coat sleeve, or to have caressed his shoe latchet if he would have made any other sign of acceptance than pronouncing her, with his unfailing propriety, to be of a most affectionate and truly feminine nature, indicating at the same time by politely reaching a chair for her that he regarded these manifestations as rather crude and startling. Having made his clerical toilet with due care in the morning, he was prepared only for those amenities of life which were suited to the well-adjusted stiff cravat of the period, and to a mind weighted with unpublished matter. And by a sad contradiction Dorothea's ideas and resolves seemed like melting ice floating and lost in the warm flood of which they had been but another form. She was humiliated to find herself a mere victim of feeling, as if she could know nothing except through that medium, all her strength was scattered in fits of agitation, of struggle, of despondency, and then again in visions of more complete renunciation, transforming all hard conditions into duty. Poor Dorothea! She was certainly troublesome, to herself chiefly, but this morning for the first time she had been troublesome to Mr. Kasabin. She had begun, while they were taking coffee, with a determination to shake off what she inwardly called her selfishness, and turn to face all cheerful attention to her husband when he said, My dear Dorothea, we must now think of all that is yet left undone, as a preliminary to our departure. I would fain have returned home earlier that we might have been at Lawick for the Christmas, but my inquiries here have been protracted beyond their anticipated period. I trust, however, that the time here has not been passed unpleasantly to you. Among the sights of Europe, that of Rome has ever been held one of the most striking and in some respects edifying. I well remember that I considered it an epoch in my life when I visited it for the first time, after the fall of Napoleon, an event which opened the continent to travelers. Indeed I think it is one among several cities to which an extreme hyperbole has been applied, see Rome and die but in your case I would propose an emendation and say, see Rome as a bride, and live henceforth as a happy wife. Mr. Kasabin pronounced this little speech with the most conscientious intention, blinking a little and swaying his head up and down, and concluding with a smile. He had not found marriage a rapturous state but he had no idea of being anything else than an irreproachable husband, who would make a charming young woman as happy as she deserved to be. I hope you are thoroughly satisfied with our stay, I mean, with the result so far as your studies are concerned, said Dorothea, trying to keep her mind fixed on what most affected her husband. Yes, said Mr. Kasabin, with that peculiar pitch of voice which makes the word half a negative. I have been led farther than I had foreseen, and various subjects for annotation have presented themselves which, though I have no direct need of them, I could not pretermit. The task, notwithstanding the assistance of my amanuensis, 
has been a somewhat laborious one, but your society has happily prevented me from that too continuous prosecution of thought beyond the hours of study which has been the snare of my solitary life. I am very glad that my presence has made any difference to you, said Dorothea, who had a vivid memory of evenings in which she had supposed that Mr. Kasabin's mind had gone too deep during the day to be able to get to the surface again. I fear there was a little temper in her reply. I hope when we get to Lawak, I shall be more useful to you, and be able to enter a little more into what interests you. Doubtless, my dear, said Mr. Kasabin, with a slight bow. The notes I have here made will want sifting, and you can, if you please, extract them under my direction. And all your notes, said Dorothea, whose heart had already burned within her on this subject, so that now she could not help speaking with her tongue. All those rows of volumes, will you not now do what you used to speak of, will you not make up your mind what part of them you will use, and begin to write the book which will make your vast knowledge useful to the world? I will write to your dictation, or I will copy and extract what you tell me, I can be of no other use. Dorothea, in a most unaccountable, darkly feminine manner, ended with a slight sob and eyes full of tears. The excessive feeling manifested would alone have been highly disturbing to Mr. Kasabin, but there were other reasons why Dorothea's words were among the most cutting and irritating to him that she could have been impelled to use. She was as blind to his inward troubles as he to hers, she had not yet learned those hidden conflicts in her husband which claim our pity. She had not yet listened patiently to his heartbeats, but only felt that her own was beating violently. In Mr. Kasabin's ear, Dorothea's voice gave loud emphatic iteration to those muffled suggestions of consciousness which it was possible to explain as mere fancy, the illusion of exaggerated sensitiveness, always when such suggestions are unmistakably repeated from without, they are resisted as cruel and unjust. We are angered even by the full acceptance of our humiliating confessions, how much more by hearing in hard distinct syllables from the lips of a near observer, those confused murmurs which we try to call morbid, and strive against as if they were the oncoming of numbness. And this cruel outward accuser was there in the shape of a wife, nay, of a young bride, who, instead of observing his abundant pen scratches and amplitude of paper with the uncritical awe of an elegant-minded canary bird, seemed to present herself as a spy watching everything with a malign power of inference. Here, towards this particular point of the compass, Mr. Kasabin had a sensitiveness to match Dorothea's, and an equal quickness to imagine more than the fact. He had formerly observed with approbation her capacity for worshipping the right object, he now foresaw with sudden terror that this capacity might be replaced by presumption, this worship by the most exasperating of all criticism, that which sees vaguely a great many fine ends, and has not the least notion what it costs to reach them. For the first time since Dorothea had known him, Mr. Kasabin's face had a quick angry flush upon it. My love, he said, with irritation reigned in by propriety, you may rely upon me for knowing the times and the seasons, adapted to the different stages of a work which is not to be measured by the facile conjectures of ignorant onlookers. It had been easy for me to gain a temporary effect by a mirage of baseless opinion, but it is ever the trial of the scrupulous explorer to be saluted with the impatient scorn of chatterers who attempt only the smallest achievements, being indeed equipped for no other. And it were well if all such could be admonished to discriminate judgments of which the true subject matter lies entirely beyond their reach, from those of which the elements may be compassed by a narrow and superficial survey. This speech was delivered with an energy and readiness quite unusual with Mr. Kasabin. It was not indeed entirely an improvisation, but had taken shape in inward colloquy, and rushed out like the round grains from a fruit when sudden heat cracks it. Dorothea was not only his wife, she was a personification of that shallow world which surrounds the appreciated or desponding author. Dorothea was indignant in her turn. Had she not been repressing everything in herself except the desire to enter into some fellowship with her husband's chief interests? My judgment was a very superficial one, such as I am capable of forming, she answered, with a prompt resentment, that needed no rehearsal. You showed me the rows of notebooks, you have often spoken of them, you have often said that they wanted digesting. 
but I never heard you speak of the writing that is to be published. Those were very simple facts, and my judgment went no farther. I only begged you to let me be of some good to you. Dorothea rose to leave the table and Mr. Kasabin made no reply, taking up a letter which lay beside him as if to reperuse it. Both were shocked at their mutual situation, that each should have betrayed anger towards the other. If they had been at home, settled at Lawick in ordinary life among their neighbors, the clash would have been less embarrassing, but on a wedding journey, the express object of which is to isolate two people on the ground that they are all the world to each other, the sense of disagreement is, to say the least, confounding and stultifying. To have changed your longitude extensively and placed yourselves in a moral solitude in order to have small explosions, to find conversation difficult and to hand a glass of water without looking, can hardly be regarded as satisfactory fulfillment even to the toughest minds. To Dorothea's inexperienced sensitiveness, it seemed like a catastrophe, changing all prospects, and to Mr. Kasabin it was a new pain, he never having been on a wedding journey before, or found himself in that close union which was more of a subjection than he had been able to imagine, since this charming young bride not only obliged him to much consideration on her behalf, which he had sedulously given, but turned out to be capable of agitating him cruelly just where he most needed soothing. Instead of getting a soft fence against the cold, shadowy, unapplausive audience of his life, had he only given it a more substantial presence? Neither of them felt it possible to speak again at present. To have reversed a previous arrangement and declined to go out would have been a show of persistent anger which Dorothea's conscience shrank from, seeing that she already began to feel herself guilty. However just her indignation might be, her ideal was not to claim justice, but to give tenderness. So when the carriage came to the door, she drove with Mr. Kasabin to the Vatican, walked with him through the stony avenue of inscriptions, and when she parted with him at the entrance to the library, went on through the museum out of mere listlessness as to what was around her. She had not spirit to turn round and say that she would drive anywhere. It was when Mr. Kasabin was quitting her that Nauman had first seen her, and he had entered the long gallery of sculpture at the same time with her, but here Nauman had to await Ladislaw with whom he was to settle a bed of champagne about an enigmatical medieval-looking figure there. After they had examined the figure, and had walked on finishing their dispute, they had parted, Ladislaw lingering behind while Nauman had gone into the hall of statues where he again saw Dorothea, and saw her in that brooding abstraction which made her pose remarkable. She did not really see the streak of sunlight on the floor more than she saw the statues, she was inwardly seeing the light of years to come in her own home and over the English fields and elms and hedge-bordered highroads, and feeling that the way in which they might be filled with joyful devotedness was not so clear to her as it had been. But in Dorothea's mind there was a current into which all thought and feeling were apt sooner or later to flow, the reaching forward of the whole consciousness towards the fullest truth, the least partial good. There was clearly something better than anger and despondency. Chapter 21 Higher fecound eke full womanly and plain, no contrafeted terms had she to seeman wise. Chaucer It was in that way Dorothea came to be sobbing as soon as she was securely alone. But she was presently roused by a knock at the door, which made her hastily dry her eyes before saying, Come in. Tantrip had brought a card, and said that there was a gentleman waiting in the lobby. The courier had told him that only Mrs. Kasabin was at home, but he said he was a relation of Mr. Kasabin's, would she see him? Yes, said Dorothea, without pause, show him into the salon. Her chief impressions about young Ladislaw were that when she had seen him at Lawick she had been made aware of Mr. Kasabin's generosity towards him, and also that she had been interested in his own hesitation about his career. She was alive to anything that gave her an opportunity for active sympathy, and at this moment it seemed as if the visit had come to shake her out of her self-absorbed discontent, to remind her of her husband's goodness, and make her feel that she had now the right to be his helpmate in all kind deeds. She waited a minute or two, but when she passed into the next room there were just signs enough that she had been crying to make her open face look more youthful and appealing than usual. 
She met Ladislaw with that exquisite smile of goodwill which is unmixed with vanity, and held out her hand to him. He was the elder by several years, but at that moment he looked much the younger, for his transparent complexion flushed suddenly, and he spoke with a shyness extremely unlike the ready indifference of his manner with his male companion, while Dorothea became all the calmer with a wondering desire to put him at ease. I was not aware that you and Mr. Kasabin were in Rome, until this morning, when I saw you in the Vatican Museum, he said. I knew you at once, but, I mean, that I concluded Mr. Kasabin's address would be found at the Poste Restante, and I was anxious to pay my respects to him and you as early as possible. Pray sit down. He is not here now, but he will be glad to hear of you, I am sure, said Dorothea, seating herself unthinkingly between the fire and the light of the tall window, and pointing to a chair opposite, with the quietude of a benignant matron. The signs of girlish sorrow in her face were only the more striking. Mr. Kasabin is much engaged, but you will leave your address, will you not, and he will write to you. You are very good, said Ladislaw, beginning to lose his diffidence in the interest with which he was observing the signs of weeping which had altered her face. My address is on my card. But if you will allow me I will call again tomorrow at an hour when Mr. Kasabin is likely to be at home. He goes to read in the library of the Vatican every day, and you can hardly see him except by an appointment. Especially now. We are about to leave Rome, and he is very busy. He is usually away almost from breakfast till dinner. But I am sure he will wish you to dine with us. Will Ladislaw was struck mute for a few moments. He had never been fond of Mr. Kasabin, and if it had not been for the sense of obligation, would have laughed at him as a bat of erudition. But the idea of this dried-up pedant, this elaborator of small explanations about as important as the surplus stock of false antiquities kept in a vendor's back chamber, having first got this adorable young creature to marry him, and then passing his honeymoon away from her, groping after his moldy futilities, Will was given to hyperbole, this sudden picture stirred him with a sort of comic disgust. He was divided between the impulse to laugh aloud and the equally unseasonable impulse to burst. Into scornful invective. For an instant he felt that the struggle was causing a queer contortion of his mobile features, but with a good effort he resolved it into nothing more offensive than a merry smile. Dorothea wondered, but the smile was irresistible, and shone back from her face too. Will Ladislaw's smile was delightful, unless you were angry with him beforehand, it was a gush of inward light illuminating the transparent skin as well as the eyes, and playing about every curve and line as if some aerial were touching them with a new charm, and banishing forever the traces of moodiness. The reflection of that smile could not but have a little merriment in it too, even under dark eyelashes still moist, as Dorothea said inquiringly, something amuses you? Yes, said Will quick in finding resources. I am thinking of the sort of figure I cut the first time I saw you, when you annihilated my poor sketch with your criticism. My criticism, said Dorothea, wondering still more. Surely not. I always feel particularly ignorant about painting. I suspected you of knowing so much, that you knew how to say just what was most cutting. You said, I dare say you don't remember it as I do, that the relation of my sketch to nature was quite hidden from you. At least, you implied that. Will could laugh now as well as smile. That was really my ignorance, said Dorothea, admiring Will's good humor. I must have said so only because I never could see any beauty in the pictures which my uncle told me all judges thought very fine. And I have gone about with just the same ignorance in Rome. There are comparatively few paintings that I can really enjoy. At first when I enter a room where the walls are covered with frescoes, or with rare pictures, I feel a kind of awe, like a child present at great ceremonies where there are grand robes and processions, I feel myself in the presence of some higher life than my own. But when I begin to examine the pictures one by one the life goes out of them, or else is something violent and strange to me. It must be my own dullness. I am seeing so much all at once, and not understanding half of it. 
That always makes one feel stupid. It is painful to be told that anything is very fine and not be able to feel that it is fine, something like being blind, while people talk of the sky. Oh, there is a great deal in the feeling for art which must be acquired, said Will. It was impossible now to doubt the directness of Dorothea's confession. Art is an old language with a great many artificial affected styles, and sometimes the chief pleasure one gets out of knowing them is the mere sense of knowing. I enjoy the art of all sorts here immensely, but I suppose if I could pick my enjoyment to pieces I should find it made up of many different threads. There is something in dobing a little oneself, and having an idea of the process. You mean perhaps to be a painter, said Dorothea, with a new direction of interest. You mean to make painting your profession? Mr. Kasabin will like to hear that you have chosen a profession. No, oh no, said Will, with some coldness. I have quite made up my mind against it. It is too one-sided a life. I have been seeing a great deal of the German artists here, I traveled from Frankfurt with one of them. Some are fine, even brilliant fellows, but I should not like to get into their way of looking at the world entirely from the studio point of view. That I can understand, said Dorothea, cordially. And in Rome it seems as if there were so many things which are more wanted in the world than pictures. But if you have a genius for painting, would it not be right to take that as a guide? Perhaps you might do better things than these, or different, so that there might not be so many pictures almost all alike in the same place. There was no mistaking this simplicity, and Will was won by it into frankness. A man must have a very rare genius to make changes of that sort. I am afraid mine would not carry me even to the pitch of doing well what has been done already, at least not so well as to make it worthwhile. And I should never succeed in anything by dint of drudgery. If things don't come easily to me I never get them. I have heard Mr. Kasabin say that he regrets your want of patience, said Dorothea, gently. She was rather shocked at this mode of taking all life as a holiday. Yes, I know Mr. Kasabin's opinion. He and I differ. The slight streak of contempt in this hasty reply offended Dorothea. She was all the more susceptible about Mr. Kasabin because of her morning's trouble. Certainly you differ, she said, rather proudly. I did not think of comparing you, such power of persevering devoted labor as Mr. Kasabin's is not common. Will saw that she was offended, but this only gave an additional impulse to the new irritation of his latent dislike towards Mr. Kasabin. It was too intolerable that Dorothea should be worshipping this husband, such weakness in a woman is pleasant to no man but the husband in question. Mortals are easily tempted to pinch the life out of their neighbor's buzzing glory, and think that such killing is no murder. No, indeed, he answered, promptly. And therefore it is a pity that it should be thrown away, as so much English scholarship is, for want of knowing what is being done by the rest of the world. If Mr. Kasabin read German he would save himself a great deal of trouble. I do not understand you, said Dorothea, startled and anxious. I merely mean, said Will, in an offhand way, that the Germans have taken the lead in historical inquiries, and they laugh at results which are got by groping about in woods with a pocket compass while they have made good roads. When I was with Mr. Kasabin I saw that he deafened himself in that direction, it was almost against his will that he read a Latin treatise written by a German. I was very sorry. Will only thought of giving a good pinch that would annihilate that vaunted laboriousness, and was unable to imagine the mode in which Dorothea would be wounded. Young Mr. Ladislaw was not at all deep himself in German writers, but very little achievement is required in order to pity another man's shortcomings. Poor Dorothea felt a pang at the thought that the labor of her husband's life might be void, which left her no energy to spare for the question whether this young relative who was so much obliged to him ought not to have repressed his observation. She did not even speak, but sat looking at her hands, absorbed in the piteousness of that thought. Will, however, having given that annihilating pinch, was rather ashamed, imagining from Dorothea's silence that he had offended her still more, 
and having also a conscience about plucking the tail feathers from a benefactor. I regretted it especially, he resumed, taking the usual course from detraction to insincere eulogy, because of my gratitude and respect towards my cousin. It would not signify so much in a man whose talents and character were less distinguished. Dorothea raised her eyes, brighter than usual with excited feeling, and said in her saddest recitative, how I wish I had learned German when I was at Lausanne. There were plenty of German teachers. But now I can be of no use. There was a new light, but still a mysterious light, for Will and Dorothea's last words. The question how she had come to accept Mr. Kasabin, which he had dismissed when he first saw her by saying that she must be disagreeable in spite of appearances, was not now to be answered on any such short and easy method. Whatever else she might be, she was not disagreeable. She was not coldly clever and indirectly satirical, but adorably simple and full of feeling. She was an angel beguiled. It would be a unique delight to wait and watch for the melodious fragments in which her heart and soul came forth so directly and ingenuously. The Aeolian harp again came into his mind. She must have made some original romance for herself in this marriage. And if Mr. Kasabin had been a dragon who had carried her off to his lair with his talon simply and without legal forms, it would have been an unavoidable feat of heroism to release her and fall at her feet. But he was something more unmanageable than a dragon, he was a benefactor with collective society at his back, and he was at that moment entering the room in all the unimpeachable correctness of his demeanor, while Dorothea was looking animated with a newly roused alarm and regret, and Will was looking animated with his admiring speculation about her feelings. Mr. Kasabin felt a surprise which was quite unmixed with pleasure, but he did not swerve from his usual politeness of greeting, when Will rose and explained his presence. Mr. Kasabin was less happy than usual, and this perhaps made him look all the dimmer and more faded, else, the effect might easily have been produced by the contrast of his young cousin's appearance. The first impression on seeing Will was one of sunny brightness, which added to the uncertainty of his changing expression. Surely, his very features changed their form, his jaw looked sometimes large and sometimes small, and the little ripple in his nose was a preparation for metamorphosis. When he turned his head quickly his hair seemed to shake out light, and some persons thought they saw decided genius in this coruscation. Mr. Kasabin, on the contrary, stood rayless. As Dorothea's eyes were turned anxiously on her husband she was perhaps not insensible to the contrast, but it was only mingled with other causes in making her more conscious of that new alarm on his behalf which was the first stirring of a pitying tenderness fed by the realities of his lot and not by her own dreams. Yet it was a source of greater freedom to her that Will was there, his young equality was agreeable, and also perhaps his openness to conviction. She felt an immense need of someone to speak to, and she had never before seen anyone who seemed so quick and pliable, so likely to understand everything. Mr. Kasabin gravely hoped that Will was passing his time profitably as well as pleasantly in Rome, had thought his intention was to remain in South Germany, but begged him to come and dine tomorrow, when he could converse more at large, at present he was somewhat weary. Ladislaw understood, and accepting the invitation immediately took his leave. Dorothea's eyes followed her husband anxiously, while he sank down wearily at the end of a sofa, and resting his elbow supported his head and looked on the floor. A little flushed, and with bright eyes, she seated herself beside him, and said, Forgive me for speaking so hastily to you this morning. I was wrong. I fear I hurt you and made the day more burdensome. I am glad that you feel that, my dear, said Mr. Kasabin. He spoke quietly and bowed his head a little, but there was still an uneasy feeling in his eyes as he looked at her. But you do forgive me, said Dorothea, with a quick sob. In her need for some manifestation of feeling she was ready to exaggerate her own fault. Would not love see returning penitence afar off, and fall on its neck and kiss it? My dear Dorothea, who with repentance is not satisfied, is not of heaven nor earth, you do not think me worthy to be banished by that severe sentence, said Mr. Kasabin, 
exerting himself to make a strong statement, and also to smile faintly. Dorothea was silent, but a tear which had come up with the sob would insist on falling. You are excited, my dear. And I also am feeling some unpleasant consequences of too much mental disturbance, said Mr. Kasabin. In fact, he had it in his thought to tell her that she ought not to have received young Ladislaw in his absence, but he abstained, partly from the sense that it would be ungracious to bring a new complaint in the moment of her penitent acknowledgement, partly because he wanted to avoid further agitation of himself by speech, and partly because he was too proud to betray that jealousy of disposition which was not so exhausted on his scholarly compeers that there was none to spare in other. Directions there is a sort of jealousy which needs very little fire, it is hardly a passion, but a blight bred in the cloudy, damp despondency of uneasy egoism. I think it is time for us to dress, he added, looking at his watch. They both rose, and there was never any further allusion between them to what had passed on this day. But Dorothea remembered it to the last with the vividness with which we all remember epochs in our experience when some dear expectation dies, or some new motive is born. Today she had begun to see that she had been under a wild illusion in expecting a response to her feeling from Mr. Kasabin, and she had felt the waking of a presentiment that there might be a sad consciousness in his life which made as great a need on his side as on her own. We are all of us born in moral stupidity, taking the world as an utter to feed our supreme selves, Dorothea had early begun to emerge from that stupidity, but yet it had been easier to her to imagine how she would devote herself to Mr. Kasabin, and become wise and strong in his strength and wisdom, than to conceive with that distinctness which is no longer reflection but feeling, an idea wrought back to the directness of sense, like the solidity of objects, that he had an equivalent center of self, whence the lights and shadows must always fall with a certain difference. Chapter 22 Nous Cosm's Long Temps L. E. Tate Simple E. T. Bon. Ne sachant pas le mal, elle faisait le bien, des richesses du cœur elle me fit elle mon, et e. tout and it couldn't come le cœur s. e. don, sans oser y penser j. e. louis don i le mine, elle importe ma vie, et n. n. s. u. t. jamais rain. Alfred de Musset. Will Ladislaw was delightfully agreeable at dinner the next day and gave no opportunity for Mr. Kasabin to show disapprobation. On the contrary it seemed to Dorothea that Will had a happier way of drawing her husband into conversation and of deferentially listening to him than she had ever observed in any one before. To be sure, the listeners about Tipton were not highly gifted. Will talked a good deal himself, but what he said was thrown in with such rapidity, and with such an unimportant air of saying something by the way, that it seemed a gay little chime after the great bell. If Will was not always perfect, this was certainly one of his good days. He described touches of incident among the poor people in Rome, only to be seen by one who could move about freely, he found himself in agreement with Mr. Kasabin as to the unsound opinions of Middleton concerning the relations of Judaism and Catholicism, and passed easily to a half-enthusiastic half-playful picture of the enjoyment he got out of the very miscellaneousness of Rome, which made the mind flexible with constant comparison, and saved you from seeing the world's ages as a set of box. Like partitions without vital connection. Mr. Kasabin's studies, Will observed, had always been of too broad a kind for that, and he had perhaps never felt any such sudden effect, but for himself he confessed that Rome had given him quite a new sense of history as a whole, the fragments stimulated his imagination and made him constructive. Then occasionally, but not too often, he appealed to Dorothea, and discussed what she said, as if her sentiment were an item to be considered in the final judgment even of the Madonna di Felino or the Laocoon. A sense of contributing to form the world's opinion makes conversation particularly cheerful, and Mr. Kasabin too was not without his pride in his young wife, who spoke better than most women, as indeed he had perceived in choosing her. Since things were going on so pleasantly, Mr. Kasabin's statement that his labors in the library would be suspended for a couple of days, and that after a brief renewal he should have no further reason for staying in Rome, encouraged Will to urge that Mrs. Kasabin should not go away without seeing a studio or two. 
would not Mr. Kasabin take her? That sort of thing ought not to be missed, it was quite special, it was a form of life that grew like a small fresh vegetation with its population of insects on huge fossils. Will would be happy to conduct them, not to anything wearisome, only to a few examples. Mr. Kasabin, seeing Dorothea look earnestly towards him, could not but ask her if she would be interested in such visits, he was now at her service during the whole day, and it was agreed that Will should come on the morrow and drive with them. Will could not omit Torvalson, a living celebrity about whom even Mr. Kasabin inquired, but before the day was far advanced he led the way to the studio of his friend Adolf Naumann, whom he mentioned as one of the chief renovators of Christian art, one of those who had not only revived but expanded that grand conception of supreme events as mysteries at which the successive ages were spectators, and in relation to which the great souls of all periods became as it were contemporaries. Will added that he had made himself Nauman's pupil for the nonce. I have been making some oil sketches under him, said Will. I hate copying. I must put something of my own in. Nauman has been painting the saints drawing the car of the church, and I have been making a sketch of Marlowe's tambourine driving the conquered kings in his chariot. I am not so ecclesiastical as Nauman, and I sometimes twit him with his excess of meaning. But this time I mean to outdo him in breadth of intention. I take Tambelaine in his chariot for the tremendous course of the world's physical history lashing on the harnessed dynasties. In my opinion, that is a good mythical interpretation. Will here looked at Mr. Kasabin, who received this offhand treatment of symbolism very uneasily, and bowed with a neutral air. The sketch must be very grand, if it conveys so much, said Dorothea. I should need some explanation even of the meaning you give. Do you intend Tambelaine to represent earthquakes and volcanoes? Oh yes, said Will, laughing, and migrations of races and clearings of forests, and America and the steam engine. Everything you can imagine. What a difficult kind of shorthand, said Dorothea, smiling towards her husband. It would require all your knowledge to be able to read it. Mr. Kasabin blinked furtively at Will. He had a suspicion that he was being laughed at. But it was not possible to include Dorothea in the suspicion. They found Nauman painting industriously, but no model was present, his pictures were advantageously arranged, and his own plain vivacious person set off by a dove-colored blouse and a maroon velvet cap, so that everything was as fortunate as if he had expected the beautiful young English lady exactly at that time. The painter in his confident English gave little dissertations on his finished and unfinished subjects, seeming to observe Mr. Kasabin as much as he did Dorothea. Will burst in here and there with ardent words of praise, marking out particular merits in his friend's work, and Dorothea felt that she was getting quite new notions as to the significance of Madonnas seated under inexplicable canopied thrones with the simple country as a background, and of saints with architectural models in their hands, or knives accidentally wedged in their skulls. Some things which had seemed monstrous to her were gathering intelligibility and even a natural meaning, but all this was apparently a branch of knowledge in which Mr. Kasabin had not interested himself. I think I would rather feel that painting is beautiful than have to read it as an enigma, but I should learn to understand these pictures sooner than yours with the very wide meaning," said Dorothea, speaking to Will. Don't speak of my painting before Nauman," said Will. He will tell you, it is all pfusheriae, which is his most opprobrious word. Is that true?" said Dorothea, turning her sincere eyes on Nauman, who made a slight grimace and said, Oh, he does not mean it seriously with painting. His walk must be Bell's Lettre. That is why I'd. Nauman's pronunciation of the vowel seemed to stretch the word satirically. Will did not half like it, but managed to laugh, and Mr. Kasabin, while he felt some disgust at the artist's German accent, began to entertain a little respect for his judicious severity. The respect was not diminished when Nauman, after drawing Will aside for a moment and looking, first at a large canvas, then at Mr. Kasabin, came forward again and said, My friend Ladislaw thinks you will pardon me, sir, if I say that a sketch of your head would be invaluable to me for the St. Thomas Aquinas in my picture there. 
It is too much to ask, but I so seldom see just what I want, the idealistic in the real. You astonish me greatly, sir, said Mr. Kasabin, his looks improved with a glow of delight, but if my poor physiognomy, which I have been accustomed to regard as of the commonest order, can be of any use to you in furnishing some traits for the angelical doctor, I shall feel honored. That is to say, if the operation will not be a lengthy one, and if Mrs. Kasabin will not object to the delay. As for Dorothea, nothing could have pleased her more, unless it had been a miraculous voice pronouncing Mr. Kasabin the wisest and worthiest among the sons of men. In that case her tottering faith would have become firm again. Nauman's apparatus was at hand in wonderful completeness, and the sketch went on at once as well as the conversation. Dorothea sat down and subsided into calm silence, feeling happier than she had done for a long while before. Every one about her seemed good, and she said to herself that Rome, if she had only been less ignorant, would have been full of beauty, its sadness would have been winged with hope. No nature could be less suspicious than hers, when she was a child she believed in the gratitude of wasps and the honorable susceptibility of sparrows, and was proportionately indignant when their baseness was made manifest. The adroit artist was asking Mr. Kasabin questions about English polities, which brought long answers, and, will meanwhile had perched himself on some steps in the background overlooking all. Presently Nauman said, Now if I could lay this by for half an hour and take it up again, come and look, Ladislaw, I think it is perfect so far. Will vented those adjuring interjections which imply that admiration is too strong for syntax, and Nauman said in a tone of piteous regret, Ah, now, if I could but have had more, but you have other engagements, I could not ask it, or even to come again tomorrow. Oh, let us stay, said Dorothea. We have nothing to do today except go about, have we, she added, looking entreatingly at Mr. Kasabin. It would be a pity not to make the head as good as possible. I am at your service, sir, in the matter, said Mr. Kasabin, with polite condescension. Having given up the interior of my head to idleness, it is as well that the exterior should work in this way. You are unspeakably good, now I am happy, said Nauman, and then went on in German to Will, pointing here and there to the sketch as if he were considering that. Putting it aside for a moment, he looked round vaguely, as if seeking some occupation for his visitors, and afterwards turning to Mr. Kasabin, said, Perhaps the beautiful bride, the gracious lady, would not be unwilling to let me fill up the time by trying to make a slight sketch of her, not, of course, as you see, for that picture, only as a single study. Mr. Kasabin, bowing, doubted not that Mrs. Kasabin would oblige him, and Dorothea said, at once, where shall I put myself? Nauman was all apologies in asking her to stand, and allow him to adjust her attitude, to which she submitted without any of the affected airs and laughs frequently thought necessary on such occasions, when the painter said, It is as Santa Clara that I want you to stand, leaning so, with your cheek against your hand, so, looking at that stool, please, so. Will was divided between the inclination to fall at the saint's feet and kiss her robe, and the temptation to knock Nauman down while he was adjusting her arm. All this was impudence and desecration, and he repented that he had brought her. The artist was diligent, and while recovering himself moved about and occupied Mr. Kasabin as ingeniously as he could, but he did not in the end prevent the time from seeming long to that gentleman, as was clear from his expressing a fear that Mrs. Kasabin would be tired. Nauman took the hint and said, Now, sir, if you can oblige me again, I will release the lady wife. So Mr. Kasabin's patience held out further, and when after all it turned out that the head of St. Thomas Aquinas would be more perfect if another sitting could be had, it was granted for the morrow. On the morrow Santa Clara too was retouched more than once. The result of all was so far from displeasing to Mr. Kasabin, that he arranged for the purchase of the picture in which St. Thomas Aquinas sat among the doctors of the church in a disputation too abstract to be represented, but listened to with more or less attention by an audience above. The Santa Clara, which was spoken of in the second place, Nauman declared himself to be dissatisfied with, he could not, in conscience, 
engaged to make a worthy picture of it, so about the Santa Clara the arrangement was conditional. I will not dwell on Nauman's jokes at the expense of Mr. Kasabin that evening, or on his dithyrams about Dorothea's charm, in all which will joined, but with a difference. No sooner did Nauman mention any detail of Dorothea's beauty, than Will got exasperated at his presumption, there was grossness in his choice of the most ordinary words, and what business had he to talk of her lips? She was not a woman to be spoken of as other women were. Will could not say just what he thought, but he became irritable. And yet, when after some resistance he had consented to take the Kasabans to his friend's studio, he had been allured by the gratification of his pride in being the person who could grant Nauman such an opportunity of studying her loveliness, or rather her divineness, for the ordinary phrases which might apply to mere bodily prettiness were not applicable to her. Certainly all Tipton and its neighborhood, as well as Dorothea herself, would have been surprised at her beauty being made so much of. In that part of the world Miss Brooke had been only a fine young woman. Oblige me by letting the subject drop, Nauman. Mrs. Kasabin is not to be talked of as if she were a model, said Will. Nauman stared at him. Sean. I will talk of my Aquinas. The head is not a bad type, after all. I dare say the great scholastic himself would have been flattered to have his portrait asked for. Nothing like these starchy doctors for vanity. It was as I thought, he cared much less for her portrait than his own. He's a cursed white-blooded pedantic coxcomb, said Will, with gnashing impetuosity. His obligations to Mr. Kasabin were not known to his hearer, but Will himself was thinking of them, and wishing that he could discharge them all by a check. Nauman gave a shrug and said, It is good they go away soon, my dear. They are spoiling your fine temper. All Will's hope and contrivance were now concentrated on seeing Dorothea when she was alone. He only wanted her to take more emphatic notice of him, he only wanted to be something more special in her remembrance than he could yet believe himself likely to be. He was rather impatient under that open ardent goodwill, which he saw was her usual state of feeling. The remote worship of a woman throned out of their reach plays a great part in men's lives, but in most cases the worshipper longs for some queenly recognition, some approving sign by which his soul's sovereign may cheer him without descending from her high place. That was precisely what Will wanted. But there were plenty of contradictions in his imaginative demands. It was beautiful to see how Dorothea's eyes turned with wifely anxiety and beseeching to Mr. Kasabin, she would have lost some of her halo if she had been without that duteous preoccupation, and yet at the next moment the husband's sandy absorption of such nectar was too intolerable, and Will's longing to say damaging things about him was perhaps not the less tormenting because he felt the strongest reasons for restraining it. Will had not been invited to dine the next day. Hence he persuaded himself that he was bound to call, and that the only eligible time was the middle of the day, when Mr. Kasabin would not be at home. Dorothea, who had not been made aware that her former reception of Will had displeased her husband, had no hesitation about seeing him, especially as he might be come to pay a farewell visit. When he entered she was looking at some cameos which she had been buying for Celia. She greeted Will as if his visit were quite a matter of course, and said at once, having a cameo bracelet in her hand, I am so glad you are come. Perhaps you understand all about cameos, and can tell me if these are really good. I wish to have you with us in choosing them, but Mr. Kasabin objected, he thought there was not time. He will finish his work tomorrow, and we shall go away in three days. I have been uneasy about these cameos. Pray sit down and look at them. I am not particularly knowing, but there can be no great mistake about these little Homeric bits, they are exquisitely neat. And the color is fine, it will just suit you. Oh, they are for my sister, who has quite a different complexion. You saw her with me at Lawick, she is light-haired and very pretty, at least I think so. We were never so long away from each other in our lives before. She is a great pet and never was naughty in her life. I found out before I came away that she wanted me to buy her some cameos, and I should be sorry for them not to be good, after their kind. 
Dorothea added the last words with a smile. You seem not to care about cameos, said Will, seating himself at some distance from her, and observing her while she closed the cases. No, frankly, I don't think them a great object in life, said Dorothea. I fear you are a heretic about art generally. How is that? I should have expected you to be very sensitive to the beautiful everywhere. I suppose I am dull about many things, said Dorothea, simply. I should like to make life beautiful, I mean everybody's life. And then all this immense expense of art, that seems somehow to lie outside life and make it no better for the world, pains one. It spoils my enjoyment of anything when I am made to think that most people are shut out from it. I call that the fanaticism of sympathy, said Will, impetuously. You might say the same of landscape, of poetry, of all refinement. If you carried it out you ought to be miserable in your own goodness, and turn evil that you might have no advantage over others. The best piety is to enjoy, when you can. You are doing the most then to save the Earth's character as an agreeable planet. And enjoyment radiates. It is of no use to try and take care of all the world, that is being taken care of when you feel delight, in art or in anything else. Would you turn all the youth of the world into a tragic chorus, wailing and moralizing over misery? I suspect that you have some false belief in the virtues of misery, and want to make your life a martyrdom. Will had gone further than he intended, and checked himself. But Dorothea's thought was not taking just the same direction as his own, and she answered without any special emotion, Indeed you mistake me. I am not a sad, melancholy creature. I am never unhappy long together. I am angry and naughty, not like Celia, I have a great outburst, and then all seems glorious again. I cannot help believing in glorious things in a blind sort of way. I should be quite willing to enjoy the art here, but there is so much that I don't know the reason of, so much that seems to me a consecration of ugliness rather than beauty. The painting and sculpture may be wonderful, but the feeling is often low and brutal, and sometimes even ridiculous. Here and there I see what takes me at once as noble, something that I might compare with the Alban Mountains or the sunset from the Pincian Hill, but that makes it the greater pity that there is so little of the best kind among all that mass of things over which men have toiled so. Of course there is always a great deal of poor work, the rarer things want that soil to grow in. Oh dear, said Dorothea taking up that thought into the chief current of her anxiety, I see it must be very difficult to do anything good. I have often felt since I have been in Rome that most of our lives would look much uglier and more bungling than the pictures, if they could be put on the wall. Dorothea parted her lips again as if she were going to say more, but changed her mind and paused. You are too young, it is an anachronism for you to have such thoughts, said Will, energetically, with a quick shake of the head habitual to him. You talk as if you had never known any youth. It is monstrous, as if you had had a vision of Hades in your childhood, like the boy in the legend. You have been brought up in some of those horrible notions that choose the sweetest women to devour, like minotaurs. And now you will go and be shut up in that stone prison at Lawick, you will be buried alive. It makes me savage to think of it. I would rather never have seen you than think of you with such a prospect. Will again feared that he had gone too far, but the meaning we attach to words depends on our feeling, and his tone of angry regret had so much kindness in it for Dorothea's heart, which had always been giving out ardor and had never been fed with much from the living beings around her, that she felt a new sense of gratitude and answered with a gentle smile, It is very good of you to be anxious about me. It is because you did not like Lawak yourself, you had set your heart on another kind of life. But Lawak is my chosen home. The last sentence was spoken with an almost solemn cadence, and Will did not know what to say, since it would not be useful for him to embrace her slippers, and tell her that he would die for her, it was clear that she required nothing of the sort, and they were both silent for a moment or two, when Dorothea began again with an air of saying at last what had been in her mind beforehand. I wanted to ask you again about something you said the other day. Perhaps it was half of it your lively way of speaking, 
I notice that you like to put things strongly, I myself often exaggerate when I speak hastily. What was it? said Will, observing that she spoke with a timidity quite new in her. I have a hyperbolical tongue, it catches fire as it goes. I dare say I shall have to retract. I mean what you said about the necessity of knowing German, I mean, for the subjects that Mr. Kasabin is engaged in. I have been thinking about it, and it seems to me that with Mr. Kasabin's learning he must have before him the same materials as German scholars, has he not? Dorothea's timidity was due to an indistinct consciousness that she was in the strange situation of consulting a third person about the adequacy of Mr. Kasabin's learning. Not exactly the same materials, said Will, thinking that he would be duly reserved. He is not an Orientalist, you know. He does not profess to have more than second-hand knowledge there. But there are very valuable books about antiquities which were written a long while ago by scholars who knew nothing about these modern things, and they are still used. Why should Mr. Kasabin's not be valuable, like theirs, said Dorothea, with more remonstrant energy. She was impelled to have the argument aloud, which she had been having in her own mind. That depends on the line of study taken, said Will, also getting a tone of rejoinder. The subject Mr. Kasabin has chosen is as changing as chemistry, new discoveries are constantly making new points of view. Who wants a system on the basis of the four elements, or a book to refute Paracelsus? Do you not see that it is no use now to be crawling a little way after men of the last century, men like Bryant, and correcting their mistakes, living in a lumber room and furbishing up broken-legged theories about Chus and Mizraim? How can you bear to speak so lightly, said Dorothea, with a look between sorrow and anger. If it were as you say, what could be sadder than so much ardent labor all in vain? I wonder it does not affect you more painfully, if you really think that a man like Mr. Kasabin, of so much goodness, power, and learning, should in any way fail in what has been the labor of his best years. She was beginning to be shocked that she had got to such a point of supposition, and indignant with Will for having led her to it. You question me about the matter of fact, not of feeling, said Will. But if you wish to punish me for the fact, I submit. I am not in a position to express my feeling toward Mr. Kasabin, it would be at best a pensioner's eulogy. Pray excuse me, said Dorothea, coloring deeply. I am aware, as you say, that I am in fault in having introduced the subject. Indeed, I am wrong altogether. Failure after long perseverance is much grander than never to have a striving good enough to be called a failure. I quite agree with you, said Will, determined to change the situation, so much so that I have made up my mind not to run that risk of never attaining a failure. Mr. Kasabin's generosity has perhaps been dangerous to me, and I mean to renounce the liberty it has given me. I mean to go back to England shortly and work my own way, depend on nobody else than myself. That is fine, I respect that feeling, said Dorothea, with returning kindness. But Mr. Kasabin, I am sure, has never thought of anything in the matter except what was most for your welfare. She has obstinacy and pride enough to serve instead of love, now she has married him, said Will to himself. Aloud he said, rising, I shall not see you again. Oh, stay till Mr. Kasabin comes, said Dorothea, earnestly. I am so glad we met in Rome. I wanted to know you. And I have made you angry, said Will. I have made you think ill of me. Oh no. My sister tells me I am always angry with people who do not say just what I like. But I hope I am not given to think ill of them. In the end I am usually obliged to think ill of myself for being so impatient. Still, you don't like me, I have made myself an unpleasant thought to you. Not at all, said Dorothea, with the most open kindness. I like you very much. Will was not quite contented, thinking that he would apparently have been of more importance if he had been disliked. He said nothing, but looked dull, not to say sulky. And I am quite interested to see what you will do, Dorothea went on cheerfully. I believe devoutly in a natural difference of vocation. If it were not for that belief, 
I suppose I should be very narrow, there are so many things, besides painting, that I am quite ignorant of. You would hardly believe how little I have taken in of music and literature, which you know so much of. I wonder what your vocation will turn out to be, perhaps you will be a poet? That depends. To be a poet is to have a soul so quick to discern that no shade of quality escapes it, and so quick to feel, that discernment is but a hand playing with finely ordered variety on the chords of emotion, a soul in which knowledge passes instantaneously into feeling, and feeling flashes back as a new organ of knowledge. One may have that condition by fits only. But you leave out the poems, said Dorothea. I think they are wanted to complete the poet. I understand what you mean about knowledge passing into feeling, for that seems to be just what I experience. But I am sure I could never produce a poem. You are a poem, and that is to be the best part of a poet, what makes up the poet's consciousness in his best moods, said Will, showing such originality as we all share with the morning and the springtime and other endless renewals. I am very glad to hear it, said Dorothea, laughing out her words in a bird-like modulation, and looking at Will with playful gratitude in her eyes. What very kind things you say to me. I wish I could ever do anything that would be what you call kind, that I could ever be of the slightest service to you. I fear I shall never have the opportunity. Will spoke with fervor. Oh yes, said Dorothea, cordially. It will come, and I shall remember how well you wish me. I quite hoped that we should be friends when I first saw you, because of your relationship to Mr. Kasabin. There was a certain liquid brightness in her eyes, and Will was conscious that his own were obeying a law of nature and filling too. The allusion to Mr. Kasabin would have spoiled all if anything at that moment could have spoiled the subduing power, the sweet dignity, of her noble unsuspicious inexperience. And there is one thing even now that you can do, said Dorothea, rising and walking a little way under the strength of a recurring impulse. Promise me that you will not again, to any one, speak of that subject, I mean about Mr. Kasabin's writings, I mean in that kind of way. It was I who led to it. It was my fault. But promise me. She had returned from her brief pacing and stood opposite Will, looking gravely at him. Certainly, I will promise you, said Will, reddening however. If he never said a cutting word about Mr. Kasabin again and left off receiving favors from him, it would clearly be permissible to hate him the more. The poet must know how to hate, says Goethe, and Will was at least ready with that accomplishment. He said that he must go now without waiting for Mr. Kasabin, whom he would come to take leave of at the last moment. Dorothea gave him her hand, and they exchanged a simple goodbye. But going out of the port cochere he met Mr. Kasabin, and that gentleman, expressing the best wishes for his cousin, politely waived the pleasure of any further leave-taking on the morrow, which would be sufficiently crowded with the preparations for departure. I have something to tell you about our cousin Mr. Ladislaw, which I think will heighten your opinion of him, said Dorothea to her husband in the course of the evening. She had mentioned immediately on his entering that Will had just gone away, and would come again, but Mr. Kasabin had said, I met him outside, and we made our final adieus, I believe, saying this with the air and tone by which we imply that any subject, whether private or public, does not interest us enough to wish for a further remark upon it. So Dorothea had waited. What is that, my love, said Mr. Kasabin, he always said, my love, when his manner was the coldest. He has made up his mind to leave off wandering at once, and to give up his dependence on your generosity. He means soon to go back to England, and work his own way. I thought you would consider that a good sign, said Dorothea, with an appealing look into her husband's neutral face. Did he mention the precise order of occupation to which he would addict himself? No. But he said that he felt the danger which lay for him in your generosity. Of course he will write to you about it. Do you not think better of him for his resolve? I shall await his communication on the subject, said Mr. Kasabin. I told him I was sure that the thing you considered in all you did for him was his own welfare. 
I remembered your goodness in what you said about him when I first saw him at Lawick, said Dorothea, putting her hand on her husband's. I had a duty towards him, said Mr. Kasabin, laying his other hand on Dorothea's in conscientious acceptance of her caress, but with a glance which he could not hinder from being uneasy. The young man, I confess, is not otherwise an object of interest to me, nor need we, I think, discuss his future course, which it is not ours to determine beyond the limits which I have sufficiently indicated. Dorothea did not mention Will again.